Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, May 9th. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. We're going to get our day started with two proclamations. The first is a proclamation recognizing the 20th anniversary of Imagination Stage, and that will be led by Councilmember Friedson. If you're here for Imagination Stage, please step forward. You can enter stage left or stage right. That was house left and house right. Yeah, that's, that's true, actually. I've been out of the game for a while. Well, I'm so excited to be here to recognize Imagination Stage. I um, am not too far removed, but not uh, so closely removed from uh, being a BAPA kid and, and participating in many of the Bethesda Academy of Performing Arts, the predecessor to what is now Imagination Stage at White Flint Mall. Uh, and was able to do performing arts as a young person, starting uh, in many ways uh, at BAPA, which uh, really taught me so many things, uh, allowed me to participate in so many different activities, enriched so much of my childhood, and got to perform with some really talented people. Of course, they went on to do things in the performing arts professionally, and what do you do if you uh, lack talent but have a decent amount of stage presence, I guess you run for office. So uh, here I am on the county council, the talentless person who got to do uh, Bethesda Academy for Performing Arts, got to see it blossom into what is now Imagination Stage, one of the preeminent children's performing arts programs and uh, performing arts uh, centers in the entire country, much less uh, the region, and just really grateful and honored to be joined here by such an amazing group. Uh, a combination of staff members and board members and advocates for this uh, organization. And uh, I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't uh, note that uh, Bonnie Fogel couldn't make it here. She's out of town, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we uh, are lifting her up and, and providing our deepest gratitudes for her for the vision uh, that she had as a mom uh, in Montgomery County uh, wanting to provide world-class arts programming for her children and for their friends and their peers, which has now ultimately led to thousands and thousands of our young people in Montgomery County being able to uh, access this incredible gem, which has really expanded its programs, focused on equity and inclusion, really brought in uh, a variety of partners and is really changing the way in which children's theater and performing arts is taught and is performed in our region and throughout our country. So I'm just really excited. We have a couple very special guests. Uh, we have the uh, relatively new, uh, although not so new, managing director, uh, Jason Najum, uh, who I'll call up first, followed by Robbie Brewer, uh, the board president emeritus, who I think serves in that capacity and in that role in uh, just about every major Montgomery County institution that we have. So why don't we start with Jason? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President, Vice Chair uh, Friedson, and our proud council member, um, President Glass, um, and the rest of the county council and to all of you today. Um, we're, we're so happy to be here. I am surrounded, as um, Andrew said, with members of the staff, um, past and present, um, who are really just uh, so grateful for this, uh, this chance to be recognized. As Andrew said, um, Imagination Stage was founded by the Titan, I would call her, Bonnie Fogel, in 1979 as the Bethesda Academy of Performing Arts, with just a handful of children in a single room. In the four decades since, we have become a nationally recognized theater arts center. Throughout our history, we have touched the lives of more than one and a half million children, both in Montgomery County and across the region. Since the launch of our first programs, the organization has undergone multiple evolutions that have dramatically increased our institution's capacity to affect the lives of children and families. The first evolution took place when we opened our doors to people with disabilities. This vision became our arts access program, which launched in 1988. You know, building on the success of this first project, the Deaf Access Program debuted the following year to meet the needs of the hard of hearing community. 
The second evolutionary phase began in 1992 when we created a professional theater season to give children the opportunity to see live productions that were artistically ambitious and tailored to them. We approached the management of the White Flint Shopping Mall Center in Rockville, uh, may it rest in peace, to set up shop in a storefront there. And over the next decade, our audience grew in that location to 20,000 attendees per year. The third evolution, uh, what we're celebrating here today, saw our transition to a new name, Imagination Stage, and to our move to our 40,000 square foot home on Auburn Avenue. This enterprise was an enormous risk for us, for the county at the time and the state that um, invested in this transition. Uh, and we, tri we basically tripled in size overnight. More recently, our fourth evolutionary stage has been driven by our Theater for Change initiative, which is comprised of three programs that use theater productions and educational workshops to explore complex social justice issues to help build our new generation of compassionate, collaborative youths who are capable of changing the world. Steadfast across all of these evolutions has been our core distinguishing purpose, positive youth development. And our work has been driven by our belief that exposure and participation in the performing arts intrinsically nourishes a child's creative spirit, inspires their embrace of the complexity and diversity of their world, and helps them overcome their challenges with hope, courage, and above all, creativity. That phrase right there, that's why I come to work every day. That's why we all come to work every day. And it, it really makes, um, gives a lot of clarity to what we do. Now today, while we continue to expand on that Theater for Change initiative, we've reached a new evolutionary stage, one created by COVID-19. While in many ways daily life seems to appear largely normal, the disruption and uncertainty caused by the ongoing slash post-pandemic have created or exacerbated obstacles faced by today's young people, such as learning loss and concerns regarding emotional health. As we always have, Imagination Stage is recalibrating our scope of work to address the needs of now for our region's youth and community partners. So, so on October 21st, 2023, we will be celebrating all of our free programs for youth and their families, which is now comprises about 30% of our work in our inaugural Arts for All Festival at our home on Auburn Avenue. Our goal is that by our 50th anniversary in 2029, uh, at least 50% of our students will not be paying to participate in this uh, event is a kickoff to that effort. Lastly, I want to thank again Council Friedson for arranging for this today, to members of his team, Angie McCarthy uh, in the room, and Angela Gear for your help in making it happen, to the thousands of staff members who have made our work happen, to the hundreds of board members who have guided us, and to the millions of children who have inspired our work each time they have passed through the front doors of our building. Thank you. And with with that, I'd love to introduce um, Board President uh, Emeritus Robbie Brewer, who was the presiding president when we moved into our building 20 years ago. Robbie. Good morning, everyone. I've been here many times, but never to have my back to the council. So uh, I'd like to say good morning to the council members I've known for many years, and I'm sorry for turning my back to you. <laughs> I'll be brief. I'm Robbie Brewer. Uh, in my day job still, I'm a lawyer at Lurch Early and Brewer in Bethesda. Um, and that's how many of the council uh, members know me. I've had a shadow career, however, uh, working with many of the county's finest uh, nonprofits and arts organizations, and it's been great. Uh, one of those is uh, Imagination Stage. I was on the board from 1996 to 2006 and board chair uh, from 2000 to 2003 when this uh, building was built. I'm going to uh, give you just a brief snippet of history about why we're celebrating 20 years of living in a parking garage. Uh, the Bethesda Parking Lot District, which manages parking in downtown Bethesda, used to have two surface parking lots in Woodmont Triangle between Rugby and Auburn Avenue. Parking demand increased and DOT said we need a parking garage. But District 1 Council Member Andrew Friedson's predecessor a while back said, you know, let's not just have a parking lot, let's have a mixed use project. And sent out an RFP to see what kind of organization could live in the parking garage as a user and could enliven the area. 
So Imagination Stage submitted an application for that RFP in the mid-1990s, and lo and behold, it won. Um, however, when the price was uh, estimated at $8 million, um, people didn't know where that money was going to come from. Um, at the time, Imagination Stage had a budget of $850,000, and it had two very compromised spaces, some old classrooms at Walt, adjoining uh, Walt Whitman High School and an old elementary school, which is now demolished, and also an old storefront in White Flint Mall, also now demolished. Uh, which was their uh, performing uh, uh, theater. The development team at the time was some folks that uh, Jason has mentioned, Bonnie Fogel, a longtime artistic director, Janet Stanford, a very active real estate-oriented board member, Gene Smith, yours truly, and a few others. Um, when Imagination Stage was advised that uh, there was no way it could raise the $8 million, uh, knowing Bonnie Fogel, as many of you do, she proceeded anyway. Uh, she had confidence that we would do it, and by the time construction was almost done, the price had risen to $13 million. So how did it all happen? Well, funding came from many sources, uh, the federal government, the state government, the county government, and many private donors, individuals, companies, uh, foundations. Uh, we had lots of help. Uh, major donors on the private side were the Lerner family, whose gift named our stage, and um, from uh, Carol Trawick, whose gift uh, named our building. Uh, but on the um, state and local side, we had great help from uh, then representatives and state senators Chris Van Holland and uh, Peter Francho, and County Executive Dove Duncan, and later County Executive uh, Ike Leggett, with many others. We also had $4 million in bond financing through m and Bank, without which it would never have been built. So in May of 2003, the building opened, and as Jason said, Imagination Stage tripled its space. It also tripled its budget, and then some. Um, it became a budget of about $4 million uh, without uh, too much uh, additional time elapsing. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, Imagination Stage's presence in the northern end of the Woodmont Triangle in downtown Bethesda has been an anchor for the uh, Bethesda Arts and Entertainment District since that time. It's uh, been a mainstay of our arts organizations, not just in the county, but in downtown Bethesda. It fulfilled Betty Ann Kroenke's desire to have a mixed-use project. Um, most of these folks here go to work every day on that mixed-use project, and they can tell you what a great place it is to work. Uh, it was a a magic moment for me serving on the board and board chair at the time a brand new building was built. It was quite an exciting time for me. It's sort of what I did in my day job, but then I was getting to do it elsewhere. So um, I would like to conclude by saying that um, the arts experience is something that we, we all sometimes take for granted, but it's imperative. And the mission that Imagination Stage has had for so many years, serving a broad spectrum of patrons uh, and kids, including uh, those who are disabled, uh, has been a great benefit to our region and our county, and it's got a great future still to come. So thank you. Thank you, Robbie and Jason. Thank you to everybody for being here. also want to acknowledge uh, Bethesda Urban Partnership. Jeff is here with us uh, as well, who's played such a big role in what you heard from, from Robbie. And you can see uh, Imagination Stage isn't just inspiring young people to think creatively and change the way that we do and imagine things. It's proving it every day, sitting in a parking lot and, and in a parking garage with this world-class uh, theater. And uh, I, one of my favorite memories is walking up with my nieces and nephews, and they asked me if we were watching the show in the garage. <laughs> and, and I didn't know how to answer that, because I said kind of, actually. Uh, but, but it really is uh, amazing to see how creatively this organization and this county with state partners and, 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 and regional partners have been able to create this amazing, amazing arts institution. So I'm going to read the proclamation. The County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland proclamation. Whereas Imagination Stage was founded in 1979 and has grown to become the region's leading professional theater and arts education center for children and youth, their families, schools, and other child service partners. It opened the doors of its 42,000 square foot state-of-the-art headquarters on Auburn Avenue in downtown Bethesda in May 2003. 
thanks to a public-private partnership that provided a community resource and anchor at the north end of Woodmont Triangle in Bethesda's Arts and Entertainment District. And whereas Imagination Stage programs have impacted over 1.5 million young people during the last 20 years, with Helen Hayes award-winning professional theater productions, international commissions and exchanges, innovative performing arts classes, student shows and camps, accessible and inclusive opportunities for the deaf community and young people with cognitive and physical differences, school residencies and professional development for teachers, as well as free offerings for underserved populations, including Title I schools, migrant youth, and young people in the juvenile justice system. And whereas Imagination Stage envisions a future where theater experiences are a fundamental aspect of all children's lives, nourishing their creative spirit, inspiring them to embrace the complexity and diversity of their world, and helping them overcome their challenges with hope, courage, and above all, creativity. And whereas arts participation at all ages, but especially in children and youth, represents an essential ingredient for positive youth development, by promoting empathy and understanding across racial and socioeconomic divides, facilitating learning, building awareness, increasing self-esteem, spurring critical thinking, and providing safe outlets for emotion and risk-taking as growing brains maximize their potential for imagination and innovation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby salutes Imagination Stage for 20 years in its new headquarters that's not so new anymore in downtown Bethesda and nearly 44 years serving Montgomery County and greater Washington community. And be it further resolved that the County Council recognizes that Imagination Stage serves a vital uh, community resource for providing innovative, relevant, accessible, and inclusive theater and performing arts education programs to the people and especially to the young people of Montgomery County and beyond presented on this ninth day of May in the year 2023 by Council President Glass and myself, Andrew Friedson, the proud council member that gets to represent Imagination Stage. Congratulations. Okay, thank you very much to Imagination Stage for making our community uh, more vibrant and artistic, and glad we were able to celebrate, uh, even though the founder, Bonnie, was not able to be here with us, but I know she's here in spirit. Um, next, we're gonna move to a proclamation uh, recognizing ALS Awareness Month. This will be led by council members Katz and Albernaz. Yeah, and whoever else is with you, please come down. Good morning. Every 90 minutes, someone is diagnosed with ALS. 
a devastating neurological disorder that damages the motor neurons, causing them to shrink and die. You progressively lose the ability to perform everyday tasks, such as walking upstairs, reaching for an item, or getting dressed, and eventually lose the ability to speak, swallow, or breathe, eventually leading to paralysis and death. The disease is often referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease in recognition of the famous baseball player who died from ALS in the late 1930s. There is no known cause. 90% of those diagnosed have no family history or genetic predisposition. And while at present there are several treatment options available to help manage symptoms and possibly slow the progression of the disease, there is currently no cure. This disease has hit home for our council family. We all remember and honor Steve Goldstein, who served as the longtime chief of staff for council member Craig Rice. Craig was hoping to be here today, but uh, the situation came up that he couldn't be. Steve was committed to his work on behalf of the council and to Craig and, and the office, never missing a day, even in his final days as he struggled to make it through the long and, as we all know, arduous days of budget before passing away in May 2019. His positive attitude and steadfast devotion to the council is remembered so very fondly. We also want to recognize and honor Jay Kenny, a valued member of our community. Jay ably served as the county's first chief of aging and disability services and then as chief operating officer for the Jewish Social Services Agency. Jay was well known for his dedication to public service and compassionate leadership. He was a fierce advocate for our most vulnerable residents, and the impact he made in the HHS field will be felt for many years to come. We all miss these two outstanding individuals as well as so many others whose life has been cruelly cut short by this devastating disease. We stand with the ALS community to advocate for and empower those impacted by the disease and are dedicated and united in the quest to find a cure and end ALS for good. I'm going to ask my friend and colleague, the chair of HHS committee, Councilmember Albernaz, to please say something. Well said and well done, Councilmember Katz. So about a year ago, I had the honor of attending the memorial service for Dr. Jay Kenney. And it was an extraordinary service that reflected on his extraordinary life. And I had the distinct honor of working with Jay for 12 years in the administration of Ike Leggett. You will not find a more dedicated and more positive human being to public service than Dr. Jay Kenney. His infectious smile, his incredible attitude, his ability to bring communities together was truly extraordinary and one of a kind. And I will also never forget where I was and what I was doing when Chuck Short shared the news that Jay had been diagnosed with ALS. I saw the struggle that he went through, the heroism that his family and the incredible providers provided to him in some of what had to have been the darkest moments that any of us could have ever imagined in his life. And I left inspired because although Jay left us too soon, we remember Jay for what he was able to do while he was here. But we have a collective responsibility to make sure that we honor and recognize his life and that of all of the other people whose lives are cut too short and whose families are devastated by having to witness what happens to somebody with ALS. And we are fortunate to have extraordinary organizations who we will recognize shortly who are in that fight. And we are all in that fight together. So this is a month to reflect. This is a month to act. This is a month to remind us that we must continue to work collaboratively to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, we also are going to be hearing from uh, Bridget Phelps, who's the managing director of the development a at ALS Association, DC, Maryland, Virginia chapter. Please. Here I have the 
Okay, you're going to do it together. We'll do it together. Good morning. I'm Tara Wong. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at the ALS Association. Bridget Phelps and I are so honored to be here today. Um, we would like to extend our deepest thanks to Mayor Elrich, Council Members Katz and Albernaz, and the rest of the Montgomery County Council for proclaiming May as ALS Awareness Month. This month, we recognize and honor the courage and strength of those who are living with ALS and their families and caregivers. As we come together to raise awareness about this debilitating disease, we also celebrate the recent approval of new treatments such as Relivrio and Tofersin that offer hope to those living with ALS. On behalf of the ALS Association and those living with ALS, I want to thank everyone in Montgomery County for this proclamation. It is crucial that we come together to work as a community and continue the fight. This proclamation is a testament to the hard work and dedication of the ALS Association and those living with ALS who will do whatever it takes to end ALS, and we are so grateful for your support. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Gabe and I will read this. Whereas amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, is a devastating disease that is progressively neurodegenerative. The disorder affects the nerves and muscles in the brain and spinal cord, gradually impacting every aspect of a person's life, including their ability to speak, swallow, breathe, and walk, and... Okay, sounds good. Whereas approximately 30,000 people in the United States have ALS, every year about 5,000 people are told by their doctor that they have the disease, and approximately 15 new cases of ALS are diagnosed every day, with the person losing their battle with the disease every 90 minutes. And whereas the ALS Association is the only national not-for-profit health organization dedicated solely to the fight against ALS and battles the disease on every front, including community services, public education, and advocacy, and Whereas the organization that provides access to ALS multidisciplinary clinics, as well as free home visits, medical equipment, loan closets, transportation grants, and monthly support groups, and whereas finding the causes of and cure for ALS will prevent the disease from robbing hundreds of thousands of Americans of their dignity and lives, and raising public awareness of ALS will facilitate the discovery of a cure. Now therefore be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby proclaims May 2023 is ALS Awareness Month. And be it further resolved that the County Council encourages residents to adopt the ALS Association, <coughs> DC, Maryland, Virginia chapter's core values of compassion, integrity, and urgency, <coughs> excuse me, to find a cure and create a world without ALS. It's presented today, signed by Council President Glass, Council Member Albernaz, and myself. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Council Members Katz and Albert Oz, and to the 
ALS Association for all the work they do and for bringing Jay and Steve's memory back into this body. May their memories be a blessing. With that, we're going to begin the rest of our day. Madam Clerk, do we have any agenda changes or announcements? Good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. We have no agenda or calendar changes to announce today. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So we're going to move to our uh, first official item on the agenda, and that is an interview panel for the Charter Review Commission. The Charter Review Commission includes 11 residents of Montgomery County, six of whom are appointed by the County Council, and five of whom are appointed by the County Executive. And the members of the Charter Review Commission serve for four years, and those terms are now up. And so this morning, we are going to interview a panel consisting of the Democrat candidates, and there are five of them. Uh, and then this afternoon, we will have a panel with our Republican and unaffiliated applicants. And so uh, I would like to invite everyone who is here, uh, Leonard Levy, Jim Michaels, Jeffrey Naftal, Linda Perlman, and Dylan Pressman up to the table. No, it's OK. We got name tags for you. It's a long table, so I, you can come down over here, too. Very good. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for your interest in serving on the Charter Review Commission and for all the work that each of you have done in the county um, over the various years of your service and residency. I have a few questions that I'm going to ask, uh, and then I'll open it up to colleagues for any other additional questions. And we'll start with Mr. Naftal and work our way down and then rotate order. Um, so Mr. Naftal, we'll start with you. Um, can you brief, uh, briefly discuss why you're interested in serving on the Charter Review Commission and explain what in your background would assist you in this role? Sure. Um, so first of all, we just moved into Montgomery County, i say two years ago now. Um, we've made it our home. We've chosen to make it our home. If you could raise the microphone a little bit. Yeah, perfect. Thank do you. I have to hold? No, I don't have to hold the button. There we go. That makes it easier. Um, so. One thing that we've chosen to do is volunteer in the county. Uh, we volunteer at uh, the animal shelter, and this is another way for me to volunteer. Um, but I also have significant experience working with charters and charter reviews. Uh, I've been in municipal government. I was in municipal government for 25 years, and as part of that was a town clerk, a city clerk, a ran elections, ran charter review processes, um, interpreted the charter, put ordinances through that reflected the charter. Um, and so that, plus my experience with human resources, which means I have the, the personnel side of the charter um, uh, knowledge as well, um, I think all of that makes me a, um, a good fit for this role. And it is a role that I think I can contribute to the county in. Thank you very much. Mr. Michaels, Thank you. Uh, turn the microphone on button right in front of you. There you go. Okay. So in my professional career, I was an attorney for a federal agency for over 34 years, writing and interpreting laws and regulations uh, to protect consumers. Um, when I retired from federal service, I decided I wanted to contribute to the local community I had lived in for 35 years. And so I started to volunteer my expertise in consumer law to serve on the county's um, Consumer Advisory Committee for uh, con Consumer Protection, uh, which I currently chair. Uh, my interest in the Charter Review Commission actually developed from serving on the Democratic Party's ballot questions advisory committee in the last two election cycles. Um, one of my principal responsibilities in 2020 was researching two of our ballot questions that dealt with uh, different proposals for changing the size and composition um, of the County Council. Um, and I also prepared a legal analysis for the party on what would happen um, to the County Charter if voters approved conflicting questions, which is a subject I testified on before the council uh, last July because my own view actually differed 
from the recommendation that came from the Charter Review Commission at the time. Um, and then in this last election cycle in 2022, I co-chaired uh, the ballot questions committee, um, which was uh, one of the charter questions that I was involved in was the one that dealt with the county attorney, which uh, this council uh, approved. Um, so I hope I could use my past experience to continue serving the county government. Um, while it's the commission that researches and makes recommendations, it's, it's the decision-making authority obviously rests with this body, the council. Um, so if I serve on the commission, I hope that I will be able to advise county officials in the same way that I advise federal agency officials, uh, which is doing fact-finding, listening to public comments, uh, building a public record and making recommendations so that the public officials can make informed decisions. Thank you very much, Mr. Michaels. Ms. Perlman. Hi. And uh, my name is Linda If you can Perlman. turn the microphone on right in front of Sorry. you. There you go. Good morning. My name is Linda Perlman. I'm a retired attorney. I have the time and interest to serve my community and the county as a member of the Charter Review Commission. For 31 years, I represented municipal governments as a city attorney through my law firm in Tacoma Park. During this time, I served as legal advisor for several municipal charter review committees. I've worked with elected officials, staff, and citizens on charter amendments and drafting charter amendment resolutions, researching and evaluating charter issues raised by council members, the county executive, other government officials, and citizen petitions is a role I know I can handle and do well. I also understand what charters are supposed to do and not do. The charter is the local government's constitution, establishes the structure, organization, and processes for the government to operate. However, it's not a legislative document, and policy matters and legislation should not be part of the charter. I'm also not a legislator. My role as commission member would not be to advance my own opinions or views on charter amendments, but rather to make recommendations to the council concerning the proposed charter amendments. I recently completed two terms as president of the Northwood Four Corners Civic Association, the NFCCA, and I'm still on the board as past president. As civic association officer, I organize public and community programs and candidate forums, of which I think most of you have been either spoken to our association or been to one of the forums. And I regularly write articles for our civic association newsletter. I've also been a volunteer for the Montgomery County AARP tax aid program. I've worked as both a scheduler and a tax preparation counselor, preparing federal and state income tax returns for county residents who need this assistance. I believe that both my legal background and my civic experience qualifies me to be a member of the Charter Review Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pressman. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I've been a resident of Montgomery County for 25 years. We came here because of the quality of the schools, and I've been proud to live in a community that um, institutionalizes kindness and strives to um, strives to improve the quality of life for its residents. Um, my kids went through uh, all their schooling in Montgomery County. There was a 14-year period where for 11 of those 14 years, I was either a president or treasurer of a PTA. I, I, our family utilized the services that Montgomery County has uh, daily. Uh, there isn't a week goes by without somebody from our family in the library. Brookside Gardens, butterflies are a constant uh, annual you know, pilgrimage. Um, and so I'd, I, I'll, I'm at a point in my life where my children have grown up and I'm, I have more time and want to give back. Um, so I served on the Juvenile Justice Commission for, for almost a decade, serving as the president in the last couple of years. I uh, served in the um, Human Rights Commission for, my, for Rockville and I really feel like now's the time that I can, you know, devote more time to my community. And uh, policy is an area which I'm pretty good at. Um, I've served five presidents, three, three federal departments, served at the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, Department of Education, served in the U.S. Senate, and now I work for the White House. Um, so I have a, a broad background in policy that... Got that um, that involves experience at the county level, at the city level, at the county level, and at the national level. Um, and I understand that policy is not just about um, 
achieving your goals, but it's also critically important that you avoid unintended, unintended consequences. And so it matters how those policies are crafted and how those policies are put together. Um, and I think that that combination of passion for my community and experience in the policy arena um, would serve me well in this position. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Levy. Thank you. I have been kind of a government junkie my whole life, um, being interested in federal government, state government, and local government. I studied government and politics in college to get a better understanding of that. I then went on to law school. One of my favorite subjects was constitutional law, and as Ms. Perlman said, this is the Constitution of Montgomery County. I am an attorney. Um, I worked for the federal government or around the federal government for most of my career, and as part of that work, I reviewed numerous documents, government documents, um, other types of documents, and I have a skill, a, a recognized skill, in reviewing documents for content, for formatting, and I think that would be a great asset to working for the commission. I just feel I have a lot to offer and hope to be selected. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for uh, in those introductions. Uh, next question, we'll start with Mr. Michaels. Uh, what do you see as the most pressing issue facing the commission? Uh, turn your microphone on, sir. There you go. As has been said already, um, the charter is our constitution for our county government. And so I think the primary issue should be, um, does it work well for everyone or does it only work well for certain groups of people? Um, I think that um, we have to ask, is there something about our charter that we could change um, that would enable our county government to address the equity and justice issues that our officials would otherwise be unable to address uh, under the current charter, um, either through executive action or legislative action. Um, the charter shouldn't be a barrier, um, but it should also be a tool um, to, prom to prom promote positive change. Um, it's a covenant between our county residents and its government, and as a covenant, it can set expectations, um, and it can also establish a mandate, not just for our, our current elected officials, but for our future elected officials. Um, and so and I hope that during the public listening sessions that the commissioner has, that it, it does hear from residents and communities uh, about their ideas for specific changes um, that come from the community. Um, in addition, I hope that our elected officials are able to point specifically to the aspects of the current charter or the current structure of government that they think are hindering their ability to do everything that they want to do um, to make changes that address um, racial equity and social justice. Um, I did find one idea, one idea in the past reports of the commission from the 2006 report, which I think is worth pursuing. Um, and the idea was that we can improve access to the electoral process uh, by focusing on how you can expand opportunities for residents in underrepresented communities to participate and acquire expertise and acquire leadership positions, possibly by restructuring some of the functions of the county government um, or reorganizing it in a way to give create new pathways for people to um, achieve leadership positions or, or achieve expertise. So I think those are worth pursuing. Thank you. Ms. Perlman, sure. turn your microphone on. Ms. Perlman, uh, your microphone. There you go. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure what the most important issue facing the commission is because I haven't been able to find any issues. I've read the 2022 report of the Charter Review Commission and the issues therein were irreconcilable valid amendments, residency requirements for election, grounds for removal of the county executive and council members. I don't know whether any of these are still issues um, and there don't appear to be any uh, Charter Review Commission meetings act after September 2022, perhaps because the term of the former commission ended when with your election in November. So I would proffer that charter amendment proposals should be nonpartisan and not directed pro or con at any of the current office holders. Um, charter amendments should be necessary. I don't believe in amending the charter willy nilly just for the point of amending the charter. Uh, but, but proposed amendments do need to be reviewed by the Charter Review Commission with the assistance of the council's attorney and staff. 
to ensure that the charter amendment is within the county's power to pass. That is the subject of the amendment is not preempted or in conflict with public general law. And I think I can help with that. Thank you. Mr. Pressman. Thank you. Um, at a time when voting rights are under attack across the country, um, it's critical that we continue to emphasize in Montgomery County broad participation in elections to expand the franchise, increase community involvement in county government affairs, and ensure transparency and accountability. And so those three principles, um, election participation, community involvement, and transparency, transparency and accountability, I think should be the bedrock of any review of the county charter. Um, we know the issues like, should the president be elected, president of the council be elected, should at-large um, members have residency re requirements, are still around and they still, you know, they're likely to come up in the next county uh, commission, review commission. And, uh, um, and I believe that our job on the commission will be to um, objectively review those issues with those three um, principles in mind, in uh, participation in elections, involvement in county affairs, and um, uh, transparency and accountability. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Levy. Yes. Our county undergoes changes every day. Things shift, things change. Does the charter need to reflect that? Has anything happened in the county that would necessitate the charter being amended? As I went through the charter, is it up to date? That would be a charge of this commission to determine that. Does it need any changes? What changes would it need? Uh, I noted that the charter recognized the council had expanded from nine members to 11 members, but I couldn't get a sense of, okay, when it's talking about the number of council members who have to vote on an issue, such as when they're doing something vis-a-vis -vis the county executive, have those numbers been changed to reflect that there are more members now than there used to be? I went through some other questions that I had. There are 42 executive departments, but the only two departments that are recognized in the charter are the Office of the County Attorney and the Department of, of Finance. Doesn't By not recognizing the other 40 departments, does this leave the question of can a new county executive come in and say, I don't like the way things are being run. I want to change the entire organization except for those two departments. Um, there are some departments that I think are essential and maybe should be included in the charter, like uh, the police, housing and community affairs, fire and rescue services, environmental protection. Maybe those should also be included so that those are firm, departments within the county and even if there's a reorganization those need to stay because I think they are essential. A um, couple other things for the office of the county attorney, the office, the county attorney represents everybody and what happens when the council and the executive are in an agreement? Who do they turn to? Is the same person supposed to be representing the interest of the county? of the county council and the interest of the county executive. Also, I noticed that the charter provides for non-competitive hiring for those with disabilities, but I said, well, shouldn't we think about having a non-competitive hiring for veterans? So some, some, those are some of the things that I think need to be looked at. Do they need to be changed? That's for the commission to decide and ultimately for the council and the executive to decide. Thank you. Mr. Naftal. Thank you. So the charter is the backbone of what you all do. And I looked at three things that I thought were important issues um, that we should consider on the commission. Um, and one, so the first one is ensuring equity, racial, economic, and social throughout the county. Um, and I think others have talked about that here. Um, I see land use and zoning that meets the needs of all residents, providing reasonable rules for each area of the county to be important. Um, and I think that campaign finance rules that provide equity for all interested in running for office is also important. And all of those would be um, fits for what we would do on the Charter Review Commission. Thank you. Uh, next question will begin with Ms. Perlman. Uh, 
can you share with us how your position on the board would help advance racial equity and social justice issues? And if you can turn your microphone on. Got to remember that. <laughs> uh, Charter Amendment Commission meetings are subject to the open meetings law, open to the public, and I'd advocate that all meeting notices and agendas be issued at least in English and Spanish. Um, I'm a little unclear whether the Charter Review Commission actually conducts public hearings, but if they do, and to the extent they do, they should be accessible in Spanish and for other non-English language speakers, maybe also with a sign language interpreter. This should be true whether whoever conducts the public hearing. For important charter amendment issues, there should also be a community and neighborhood sort of listening sessions, and many of these listening sessions should be directed to minority and immigrant communities. Uh, advancing racial equity and social justice issues, especially through a sort of nerdy commission such as the Charter Review Commission, is a process, and there are no easy answers. However, it's a goal that I would work towards if appointed. Thank you. Mr. Pressman. Thank you. Um, it's been said a few times that the county charter is the constitution of the county, but it has some significant differences from the national constitution, the first of all, being that it doesn't have a Bill of Rights and it's not a legislative document as much as a foundational governance document. Um, and therefore it's our duty, our duty as a community, to ensure that that governance is uh, infused with social justice, racial equity, with transparency and accountability for um, government officials. Um, and so in, in the Commission, it will be our job to ensure that as we review proposals that come for the county uh, charter, we're, we are focusing on social justice and equity issues, we're focusing on transparency, accountability, and we're focusing on uh, participation in the electoral process and participation in the community for all of our community. Um, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Levy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, most of my career has been with the federal government to prevent discrimination within that government. So I'm very sensitive to racial equity and social justice. Uh, one thing that I noticed, the charter should be reviewed to make sure it's fair to all groups, but one thing I noticed, or one question that I have is that um, we're seeing across the nation many laws that are saying we're passing this law to better our voting system. And yet when you look beneath the surface, you see, no, they're not. They're discriminating against racial groups. And this is unjust. I would want to make sure that the county never wound up in that situation. So when I look at, and I'm not sure it's the charge of this commission, because there is a redistricting commission, but it's necessary to make sure that there's something within the charter so that there can never be an opportunity for there to be gerrymandering to force one racial group to have less say in the county government than other groups. Thank you. Uh, were you done? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay. Mr. Naftal. So I saw two things that I think might be possible. Um, the first might be to consolidate diversity efforts in the county in a separate division or department. The other thing I saw might be to hold board meetings or council meetings in various areas of the county to bring the work closer to the people. Um, both of those are um, reflective of um, getting at the root of the issue as opposed to, to kind of looking above from 30,000 feet. Thank you. Mr. Michaels. Um, in terms of positioning the commission to work on uh, racial equity and social justice, I think positioning effectively starts with effective outreach. Um, you have to have effective outreach to the, effective commu the affected communities and constituencies, and that really means asking who's not being heard and reaching out to them where they are, uh, because you can't just expect people to appear in your county office building. Um, effective outreach also means pu publicizing um, your listening sessions using communication channels that are aimed at reaching your target audiences. Um, and I know everybody, you know, focuses on social media, but there are other things. There are community organizations, um, faith-based groups, 
Um, you have to reach people where they are, and it's not always on social media. Uh, and then it continues with actually listening to the concerns um, that members of the community and residents have. Um, and good ideas can come from anywhere and everywhere, uh, from individuals, from community groups, from businesses, from elected officials, from the agencies and the folks who work at the agencies. So um, as a commission member, I would be particularly want to hear um, from those groups, but also from you know, what our public officials tell us about their problems in, in being uh, elected officials and where, they, where the issues are. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions, and they're pretty straightforward, and we'll begin with Mr. Pressman for the first one. The commission typically meets once a month for one to two hours. Uh, will you be able to make the time commitment as necessary? Yes, I will be able to make that commitment. Thank you. Mr. Levy. Yes, I retired from my federal government job. My job now is something I want to do, and so my schedule is very flexible, and I wouldn't have any problem making sure this is a priority. Great. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Yes, um, and I'm, retirement is a very flexible tool. Um, but uh, it's important also, I think, you know, that you can make time for the work outside of the commission meetings. It's the work that occurs outside the meetings, which is just as important. So yes. And this problem. I have no problem with the meetings. In fact, I look forward to trying to fill my time. Thank you. <laughs> with uh, Civic. Thank you. Uh, and last question I have, we'll start with Mr. Levy. Are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? Not that I am aware of. None that I'm aware of. No. No. There are no conflicts of interest. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for uh, answering our questions. Um, I do not see any co comments from my colleagues. Uh, and so we will be interviewing the Republican and unaffiliated candidates later this afternoon, uh, and we'll be making decisions uh, after we conclude the budget. So stay tuned. Thank you all very much for your service and your interest in serving. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, we are moving on to Legislative Day 15, and we are going to call, uh, call a bill for final reading, Bill 1723, Taxation, Recordation, Tax Rates, Amendments. The GO Committee recommends enactment with amendments, and I will turn it over to the Chair of the GO Committee, Ms. Stewart. Great. Well, thank you. Um, not seeing our council staff yet uh, joining us, uh, we, but uh, <laughs> we I'll, are I'll, we are ahead of schedule. We're ahead that of schedule. Is I, I'll I'll jump in. Uh, so there the, are only a few floors above us. Yes, so they, they uh, can come on down. <laughs> uh, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee uh, on April 24th discussed Bill 17-23. Uh, that was introduced, the lead sponsor was Council Member Mink, the co-sponsor, Council Member Jawando. Uh, what this bill would do would increase the rate of the recordation tax levied under state law for certain transactions, and it would allocate the revenue received from the recordation tax for certain uses, and the third thing is generally amend the law governing the recordation tax. Um, the Government Operations Committee discussed the bill, um, as well as amendments uh, put forward by myself. Councilmember Katz and Fanny Gonzalez, with support from Council President Glass, Council Members Lorianne Sales, Kristen Mink, and Will Jawando. And we also discussed an amendment put forward by Vice President Friedson. The committee recommended by a vote of two to one um, the enactment of Bill 17 23 with the amendments proposed by myself, Councilmember Katz, and Fanny Gonzalez. I want to thank my colleagues for the discussion um, and the general agreement on our goals uh, as we had this conversation on April 24th. We talked about the need to fix our ongoing structural challenges with uh, the CIP budget, especially how we fund our school construction. Um, it was very important to us that we do not impact starter and affordable homes and that we maintain the current rate for home sales of $600,000 or less that we put in place a progressive one-time tax um, for home purchases, that we address the current FY24 and 28 CIP shortfall, and in do doing so, uh, particularly address uh, the funding of school construction over the next few years, 
in the recognition of the vital need in our communities, express, especially with the increase in enrollment projection, protect, uh, projections and the importance uh, to economic development of keeping our school system strong. And then finally, our goal is to enhance housing stability by increasing funds for rental assistance. Uh, assistance. Um, I just want to again thank my colleagues on government operations and um, Council Member Mink and Juwando for first bringing uh, this bill to us. Uh, we really feel like the, the bill uh, with its amendment will uh, improve our communities, continue to make sure that we have stable, predictable uh, conditions and excellent infrastructure. Um, and as we were balancing all the needs, um, for making sure that people can still afford to buy homes in our community. And so um, I'll say I think we did an excellent job. And I want to thank uh, my colleagues for this. I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair, for the work that you and the committee did. Uh, I know that there were a lot of different moving parts, um, but uh, I uh, appreciate the amendment you put forward, which I gladly supported. I want to turn it over to Councilmember Mink, who uh, introduced the original legislation. Uh, thank you, President Glass, and uh, thank you, Chair Stewart. Um, I absolutely wanted to thank the community advocates and champions for our schools who have been working to bring these needed adjustments to the recordation tax since uh, prior to my tenure on the council. Um, very grateful to uh, Councilmember Jawando for partnering with me on the original bill, following previous work on this issue as well. Um, to my staff who crunched numbers for weeks with, uh, with Glenn Orlin. Um, and then huge thanks uh, to Councilmember Stewart for her leadership in uh, crafting this fantastic amendment and to her staff uh, that now comes to us recommended by the GO Committee and, and really with tremendous support. Um, it includes robust new funding to close the structural gap that we're facing in the CIP. Uh, in order to support school construction and transportation projects while critically while avoiding um, tax burdens on home buyers at the lower end of the cost spectrum. Um, and I want to note that as we work to preserve affordability for home buyers, we also need to address the escalating affordability crisis faced by tenants, and the proposed amendment does so by maintaining a funding allocation for rental assistance uh, within the recordation tax premium, a major contributor to traditional monthly rental assistance for over a decade. And uh, by continuing that 2008 formula fix, while increasing revenue via the Stewart Fanny Gonzalez Katz proposal, as supported by President Glass, myself, and Councilmember Jawando, addresses the rising need for rental assistance without overburdening the operating budget every year. Um, students, families, and businesses all want stable, predictable conditions and excellent infrastructure. And with this amendment uh, and this bill, we have a chance to provide much needed support for families facing eviction while generating the revenue we need to close the $200 million gap in the CIP over the next five years, positively impacting the operating budget and holding buyers of lower cost homes harmless. So again, I thank uh, Chair Stewart, Councilmember Katz and Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez for their thoughtful amendment. Um, President Glass and Councilmember Jawando for their support, uh, and I urge the council to pass this bill as amended. Thank you very much, Councilmember Ming, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, uh, <laughs> President Glass, and uh, good to see one of the main advocates, mm -hmm. Laura Stewart, come in smiling yeah. <laughs> this morning uh, from MCC PTA and so many other places. This was a really, I, I'm just glad when the legislative process works, and you know, we, we don't all things are hard and often hard things are hard to do and this was an example of uh, us tackling an issue that's a big issue and and it has impacts real impacts in our communities and it also addresses real needs and the bill got better through the legislative process um, and I want to really thank uh, Councilmember Mank and Councilmember Stewart and Fanny Gonzalez and Councilmember Katz and Glass everyone who every council member who contributed to the discussion um, uh, Councilman Friedson as well as part of the offering uh, alternatives. All that is important uh, to, to the end process. Uh, you know, when we when we took action on the previous council in 2020 to change the growth and infrastructure policy, the subdivision staking policy to the growth and infrastructure mm -hmm. policy, and then change the way uh, impact taxes were calculated, we left a structural deficit in, in the CIP, particularly as it relates to school funding. And there was a bill at the time to uh, address that to do some similar changes to the recordation tax that did not get adopted for uh, various reasons. Um, and <clears throat> I, I'm just often reminded, I've been doing legislation long enough to know that there is an opportunity cost lost when you don't act 
Um, and uh, but this is also a good reminder that you can come back and correct things. So I'm really happy that uh, we were able to make this bill better, protect homeowners at the lower end of the scale, do it in a progressive way, provide funding for our schools, which will also free up money in the CIP for transportation projects, provide rental assistance. We had asked the state for more rental assistance money. We didn't get it. And this will provide a significant amount of funding. So um, no, it wasn't easy, but uh, really urge colleagues to support it and thank everyone for the work. Uh, it's it's a big deal and it's tackling an important big issue for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez. Good morning. Um, I'm gonna stand up so you can so I can show up my shirt. Can you see this? <laughs> <laughs> this is from uh, Mario Lollerman Middle School. I went to their play last week, and it was amazing play. And it was the Wizard of Oz. And the the reason why I'm probably showing off the shirt not because they gave it to me. But also because back in 2019, when I was on the planning board, these cons the construction of their performing performance arts facility came in front of the, the planning board. And to see this whole theater live with these kids, you know, playing in the theater, gave me so much pride. And to have a facility like that in Aspen Hill in my district, is something that I want to see across the whole county. And for that to happen, we need money. We need to have more funds to ensure that we have all these CAP projects within MCP, MNCPS, MCPS um, become a reality. Um, it just makes a difference when you have a place that is healthy, that is clean, that is, that is in a great condition to see kids and their, and their teachers and the staff in the school joining forces and in this case having this amazing performance uh, with the community was a big deal and I think every school throughout the county deserves that and um, I think we have the responsibility to ensure that we're raising funds to make those projects happen across the county. It really broke my heart when I saw all the students who came for the public hearing about what two months ago at this point telling us that they have buildings that are not in good shape that are actually dangerous. So we it's not just about taking a photo with them and say, wow, you did a great job. You came here and you testified. What a great citizen you are as a, when I say citizen, I meant as a civic mm -hmm. servant. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's a call for us to take action and do something about it. And I know this is not, this recordation tax is not something that is very popular with everybody. But it's a need, and uh, I advocated for it when I was on the planning board. It failed, but anyway, now we're here, um, and we're moving forward. So now, that's why I decided to wear the shirt today, because I thought it made sense. Um, and with that, I hope my colleagues will vote yes on this. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the advocates who kept pushing, especially you, Laura. So, Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Ludke. Thank you, President Glass and uh, members of the Government Operations Committee. And I want to thank Council Members Balcom and Mink for your thoughtful discussions of this issue while it was before the GO Committee. Um, to be clear, I have concerns about raising the recordation tax in this way at this time, um, even to the level that was authorized or recommended by the GO Committee. Um, so a couple of points. We can talk about the structural deficit in the CIP, and I know it's been talked about a lot. I know it's one of Ms. Stort's um, uh, big talking points. And I think it's important to take a little step back and think about what we face. So, and to Council Member Jawando's point when he was speaking, there are hard decisions. There are gonna continue to be hard decisions because you can't tax your way out of making hard decisions. Um, incredibly important projects may not be funded because we don't have the revenue. That's going to be an issue with every budget that comes before us, whether it's a capital budget or an operating budget. And so we have to make those decisions. It's not unique. We are faced with other challenges this year in terms of our revenues overall, but that's what budgeting is, and you can't escape having to make those choices. In the capital budget, where there are many worthwhile projects that have been in the later years of the six-year CIP for a long time, and many more that people have that are in master plans that people have been advocating time and time again. I'm thinking of my friends in Durwood who are still waiting for a great many things um, that aren't even in the six-year CIP right now. 
So we have to prioritize based on what we believe is best for our residents, and that's going to be something that we have to tackle year in and year out. And so whether we increase this particular tax by a lot, a little less, or a little, little less, we're still going to face the same tough decisions we always face this time next year. And that's especially true if you're going to rely more on the recordation tax, which is volatile. It just is. By its own definition, it is subject to market forces that are beyond the control of this body, and it is not stable. And it, frankly, has underperformed expectations, which is part of what led us to our current situation. Um, and there are serious consequences to our residents of raising this tax. Um, I disagree with the proposal of the GO committee version, particularly because it more than doubles the tax for properties value between $600,000 and $750,000. You're going to make it more expensive to purchase a home in that range, a range that represents much of the most affordable detached housing stock in our county. These are not new construction. These are 50, 60, 70 year old homes. Um, but that is the economic reality of what the sales price is in the current market. Our real estate market prices for a detached house has already increased 32% since 2019. And in February, we recommended using $80 million in one-time income tax revenue surplus to boost our CIP of one-time capital projects and appropriate use of one-time funds. But the county executive recommended using much of those funds for ongoing operating budget expenses. We have to acknowledge that we had other options there. Um, I know that it majority of the council supports some level of recordation tax increase and the very real need to preserve funding schedules for school projects that have already been delayed multiple times. Um, but I also recognize the need to not create other consequences. And you know, you can't you can't finance the recordation tax in your home purchase. And for those who had to purchase homes um, in the mo more recent time and maybe looking to refinance subsequently when mortgage interest rates lower again, an optimistic hope for the future, they will be subject to this. Um, so I move for the council to take up council member Friedson's increase proposal that's located on circle pages 38 and 39 of the packet. Um, and I believe Ms. McCartney um, and Mr. Orland have summarized starting on page six. Uh, while it will still generate significant additional revenue, it's more realistic about the consequences of adding expenses to recordation fees on properties valued at $750,000 and lower. I'm thinking of our middle income families here. Um, and it's a less drastic increase in expenses in an already extremely challenging housing environment and inflationary environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Ludke has moved uh, an amendment. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Councilmember Balcom. Um, so there's a number of people who want to speak on the original uh, piece of legislation. Uh, so I will go and, and see if people want to speak on this motion that is currently on the, on the floor. Uh, but first, before I do that, uh, if Ms. McCartney Green uh, and Mr. Orling could uh, better articulate what the proposal is. Um, the proposal from Mr. Friedson or Mr. Uh, or the committee's recommendation? Uh, Mr. Friedson's as moved by Ms. Right. Ludke. Okay. Uh, Mr. Friedson's recommendation, which has been pointed out, is um, described on, uh, begin, be, uh, beginning on pages um, six, I believe it is, just, sorry, just getting caught up. Um, at the bottom of page six and top of page seven, um, it is the same as the proposal from the committee up to $600,000. In other words, it would keep the base recordation tax rate uh, that goes to the operating budget the same. It keeps the school increment um, of $2.37 per $500 the same. And it also uh, keeps the premium rate uh, between uh, $500,000 and $600,000 the same. Now I need to get back to this on the premium because there's a different allocation of funds. Um, from $600,000 to a $1 million, uh, the rate would be a 50% increase over the current premium rate. It would go to $3.45 per $500. And then for over a $1 million, the rate would go to 
of $5.50, which is about 139% increase uh, over the current premium. Um, the other major change in Mr. Friedson's proposal compared to the Stuart uh, Katz Fanny Gonzalez proposal, the Stuart Katz Fanny Gonzalez proposal would split the allocation of the premium funds, which is now 50% to rental assistance programs and 50% to county government CIP projects, would change that to one third uh, rental assistance, one third county government CIP, and one third MCPS capital projects. Uh, Mr. Friedson's proposal would say 40% of the premium funds, including the ones collected between 500,000 and 600,000, uh, would go to MCPS, 30% to rental assistance, 30% to um, county government CIP projects. Uh, the result is that um, uh, his proposal is forecast would generate uh, with uh, the uh, three-month delay, if you will, in the implementation of the recordation tax. The committee entirely, uh, unanimously recommended uh, implementing whatever you approve today uh, on October 1st of uh, 2003, which 2023, which is different than the original bill, which was July 1st, 2020. 2023, going to talk about that later as to why that is. Uh, it would generate um, about $123.6 million in new revenue uh, compared to $187.3 million for the uh, GEO Committee recommendation. Can you CID. say that a little bit louder again? Sorry? That's a really important point. And I, and, and can you restate that, those sure. dollar the, 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 figures you just um, said? The, 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 the Friesen proposal would, in, would increase revenue for the CIP, both schools and county government together, by $123.6 million over the next five years. Uh, the Stewart, um, uh, the, the GEO Committee recommendation uh, is $187.3 million. Uh, and then for rental assistance, the uh, Friesen proposal would add uh, $2.4 million uh, for rental assistance over the five years. Um, the GEO committee would uh, increase it by $52 million over the six-year period, five-year period. So for the CIP, as I just heard it, and just to set the conversation, there is a $61 million difference in the CIP between the GEO recommendation and the amendment that's before. Right? Actually, that's about right 63 now. and a half. 63 and a half. And uh, about, a, about a $50 million difference on rental assistance. Okay. Um, I will now start turning to colleagues. Uh, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. It, so this is to the motion, but clearly it is all part of the larger conversation. But yes, we are we are on this motion right now. But you can talk about recordation taxes. Oh. It, it is all part and parcel. So. <laughs> So um, I, I want to start by thanking the co-sponsors and um, really appreciate the hard work of council members uh, Mink and Jawando in coming up with additional ways for us to um, fund the CIP budget um, in Bill 1723. And I want to thank my colleague, Chairwoman Stewart, uh, Council Member Fanny Gonzalez, and Katz for their amendment. Uh, to the bill to increase parts of the recordation tax to not only help our um, our middle class families who are going to become homeowners, but our low income families who are going to be um, dealing with um, increasing rents over the next few years. Um, you know, the difference between uh, 50 plus million being generated from people who are moving to our community to invest in the amenities that they're benefiting from. People are moving here because our schools are great, but they will not stay here if our schools do not continue to do well. And so when you move someplace, you move somewhere that's rich with amenities and you want to fund those amenities as a part of the community, um, Earlier this year, I went to South Africa, and one of the visits that we did was in a small township, and the people were so proud that they used their resources, the very limited resources, to build the school. It's, the school was named Zamasa, and it stood for community school. If you live in our community, 
and you benefit from the richness, the diversity, the richness of our students that graduate from our school system, you should want to invest in our schools. I'm so proud of our schools. My daughter graduated from this school. I started the Youth Advisory Council because our schools are so important. Our students are worth it. They're worth the investment if you choose to move here. Whether you have school students in the school system or not, it's part of the amenities and it's part of the richness that builds the fabric of this community. And so I urge my colleagues to adopt this amendment because we all play a role in funding the school system and ensuring that our students have a quality education and a quality building that we should all be proud to invest in. There shouldn't be any discussion about who should have to pay and who should benefit. And if we can reap the rewards and spread that reward to ensure that our renters can stay in their homes and not face evictions, why not? Why not do what we can? And so thank you to my colleagues for um, you know, really being thoughtful and intentional with this legislation, not just for our schools, but also for our renters. Um, we do have tough decisions to make, and we all play a role in ensuring that we live in a community that's proud of the schools that we build and the schools that we send our children to. I yield. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, uh, Council President. Um, first of all, I want to very publicly thank Chair Stewart and her office, Cecily and Paul, um, for all their hard work. My name has been associated with, with this amendment, and I'm proud that my name is associated with it, as is as, as, uh, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. But I, I can tell you the lion's share of this was done by Councilmember Stewart's office. And I certainly am someone who doesn't like taxes, just like everybody else. I, I am certainly someone who understands that taxes are needed when you're paying for what is needed to be in our community. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a forced, it's a forced payment. No one, no one necessarily likes to be forced to do that. And I also have to tell you, when council members Mink and Jawando first suggested this legislation, I was extremely concerned. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, recordation tax to the point is volatile. The funds received from this tax is, um, are, you know, is always questionable how much you're actually going to get. I do think it should be noted, and I've asked uh, 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 Dr. Orland several times uh, publicly to say that, to remind people that if they refinance their home, and do not take any additional equity with that refinancing, that the, the, uh, the uh, recordation tax is, the, is not, is, there is no recordation tax. And, and I know you would correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Orlin, so <laughs> you, you jump at that chance. But, but so I think that is very necessary. This is, this is not for someone who's gonna refinance this, unless you take equity. This is for someone else. I, I have to tell you, when I saw Councilmember Finney Gonzalez wear the shirt about the Wizard of Oz, I, I, I didn't do it for that purpose. But, but when I when I saw her, I really thought that she it was based for, about Paul Ellis because, as far as I'm concerned, he was just the side of the Wizard of Oz on this one. He, you, you talk to him two seconds later, he comes back with behind this curtain. It wasn't a curtain, but he comes back with all these all these solutions, and so. I think we are walking a tightrope. This is not fun. Everybody says, you know, you know, you, you have to make difficult decisions. Well, this is part of the difficult decisions we have to make. But if we don't fund our schools and all the other things that are being associated with this tax, we are not going to have the Montgomery County in a few years that we have today. We, you know, you get people all the time complain that, you know, it, when I was growing up, it was a, a different county. When I was growing up, it was a different county too. I mean, I, I, I can go back longer than a week on one Montgomery County, and it was a different county. And in a lot of ways, we're a much better, you know, nothing's ever perfect, but we're a much better county. But if we want to continue 
If we want to continue to be the county we are proud of, we better make certain especially that our schools are taken care of. I am supporting this, obviously. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Member uh, Thanks, everybody. So I'll start with the good news. <laughs> um, I think there's a complete agreement that we need to do more to fund our schools. No question about that. There is complete agreement that the costs have escalated, in part because of inflation, that none of us could have anticipated because of what's transpired the last four years. And it is good news that our school system is seeing an increase of students, especially over uh, the last two years, um, because we have to continue to maintain our most important asset and treasure, which is our school system. And I also appreciate very much the work of the committee in thinking thoughtfully through a way to provide some additional revenue and do so in such a way that attempts to not impact, especially first-time homeowners. Um, and and you know, I, I give you guys a lot of credit for, for doing that. And, and I support the notion of the need for an enhancement of a recordation tax, I do. Um, but I think this is a really big swing. And I think that this could ultimately end up being de minimis because this tax cannot and should not be looked at in isolation. We are deliberating right now a possibility of a 10% property tax increase across the board. We just found out a few days ago that the impact taxes for both transportation and school impact taxes have gone up almost double digits for transportation impact tax and between 40 and 70 percent for school impact taxes. Our real estate market is the only economic engine and indicator that has been exceeding projections over the last few years. It has been the golden goose. It has been what has funded so much of the projects that we all agree are so important. But we also have to consider that, as was noted earlier, the assessed valuation of homes has increased dramatically, more than double digits, over the last 10 years. We have also seen, just recently, an increase in WSSE's rate increase of 7%. Um, there's a possibility of electricity rate increases. Uh, which we will be deliberating in the not too distant future. And the, own, the OLO report that came out in, in assessing this was expressed some concern that again, this could be de minimis over time. We're projecting that this brings in what it says it's going to bring in, but I'm concerned that when you take the totality of all of the taxes, both current and the ones that we are proposing, that it's going to exacerbate a problem that is very real and acute. We are losing residents at the highest end of here in Montgomery County of incomes. And we are not supplanting them with new folks coming in. We have all talked about that we are competing as a region with our colleagues in Northern Virginia and the District of Columbia, both for talent, for businesses, um, but for also those residents that are in a position to be able to, through their means, help us afford our social safety net programs, our capital projects, and so much more. I also note that we've had a very aggressive CIP over the last 20 years. And I think that's a good thing. We've been able to build a record number of schools uh, and renovate them. We've been able to build a record number of libraries and renovate them recreation centers, park projects, we've built new police stations, new fire stations. But unfortunately, the practical reality is, is that that has come with debt. And I don't know the exact percentage, but we've all talked about it in our talking points while we were campaigning. If debt service, just as a line item, were a, a department, it would be one of the largest in county government. That can't continue. We have to reel that in. And I acknowledge the need for us to have additional revenue, which is why I support an increase of recordation tax, but a 200% increase in any tax um, for homes over a million dollars. And homes over a million dollars are not what they once were. They're just not. 
And so I, I worry that by doing this, all of the things we've talked about, all of the potential benefits are actually going to be more difficult. And so I support the motion that was made for the amendments to bring this down just a little bit. Uh, and especially for those homes between um, the, the 600 and 750,000, which represent a very significant percentage of homes here in Montgomery County, I think that that's, that's critical. And while I understand the refinancing and, and the equity, it still impacts the possibility of refinancing and equity. And I think of aging populations trying to figure out how to stay in their homes. Um, you know, you use every tool in your toolbox and I think this is going to be a deterrent, I really do. And so that's why uh, I'm concerned about it. Um, and, and I will support the motion that was made by Councilmember Lukey. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Um, so I think everybody agrees, uh, as Councilmember Alberno said, there's no doubt that we need additional funding for school construction. And I uh, sincerely want to thank uh, Councilmember Mink and Jawando for starting this conversation and uh, to really putting the, the work into it. And of course, um, Chair Stewart and Katz for co-sponsoring the, uh, the, the First Amendment <laughs> and just taking the really deep dive. I know that it was a very uh, difficult task and I appreciate that. Um, and I understand the balance that you're trying to achieve by increasing much needed revenue and without uh, placing a burden on homeowners. Um, I believe that the, uh, I support the amendment from Councilmember uh, Ludke, the original uh, amendment from Councilmember Friedson as a better balance. Uh, the housing shortage along with the rising cost of housing is the most complex issue we face in Montgomery County. And the, with the cost of housing skyrocketing, the median price of the house of $600,000 um, anyone looking to enter the housing market knows that this is either a very modest house or uh, someplace way in the outer suburbs. So we're not talking about a luxury home. We're talking about a, a, a very modest home in Montgomery County. Uh, adding to the cost of buying a house through the increase of recordation tax for this median income house uh, I, is not the right balance. Um, and for so many, home ownership is difficult. I know when I bought my house, I cobbled together every single dime, every single dime to go to closing. And, uh, and I'm sure it's still the same way. Um, I know many people who are trying to get into the housing market and they're doing the same. Uh, and it's so much more difficult now. Uh, we should not be creating obstacles for home ownership for the median cost of a home in the county. Um, and to respond to my colleagues about the passion for school construction, I share that passion. Uh, we need to build our schools we, and, our rec, uh, and our rec centers and our fire stations. Uh, we, have, uh, we're, we have a deficit in our construction. We, we need to, to build state-of-the-art um, facilities for our community. Um, but someone has to pay for it. And as Council, my good friend, Councilmember Katz stated, this is, we're walking a tightrope. And we need to make sure that the balance, um, we, that we can generate revenue at the same time that we're not uh, making it such a burden for home ownership and uh, pushing people out of the county. Um, and it is a tightrope. Uh, so I support the Ludke uh, amendment. I think this proposal moves the higher percentage um, it, of, of the premium funding to school construction, which I think that we all agree on. Um, and just a, no a note for another day in terms of school, school construction, Councilmember Albernaus already mentioned it, uh, the impact tax is scheduled for a significant, significant increase in the coming months, uh, which will create uh, additional funding for school construction. Um, so, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, the Ludke Amendment, Friedson Ludke Amendment, um, just provides a softer landing for, by definition, 
the middle of the homeowner ladder ships, uh, the home ownership ladder. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you. I think it's technically the Ludke Balcom Amendment, which is okay. the Friedson Amendment. So there we go. Uh, if that simplifies things or not. Um, and the namesake of that amendment, Vice President Friesen. Well, thank you for that clarification, Mr. President. I will note that the uh, it was the Friedson failed amendment in committee. So I'm hoping that my uh, female colleagues here can uh, can help me out. Maybe uh, a different brand uh, to help for uh, the same policy. But um, obviously, I put this forward. I, I put this forward for for the reasons stated, uh, and I really do appreciate. Uh, first of all. Councilmember Albernaz is noting the, the good news here. Uh, there is a significant change. This is a county council that is recognizing the need to raise recordation tax and provide a significant funding stream for schools. So regardless of uh, whatever subsequent votes come from today, I, I think that is the big takeaway here, and I think that's important. Now, the question is how to do it, who to impact, uh, and uh, how uh, to, to do it, and I think there are some uh, questions uh, about that. I really do appreciate uh, Chair Stewart for all of her work, not just on the GO committee, but uh, her and her team that uh, Councilmember Katz and Fonny Gonzalez uh, noted for really putting together a proposal. My biggest concern with the original proposal that I appreciate Councilmembers Mink and Juwando putting forward uh, was its impact on under $600,000 homes, which really would have uh, a significant impact. And Councilmember Stewart's proposal really does address that uh, in a significant way, as mine does as well. And so I really do acknowledge uh, and, and appreciate that. Um, I, I realize there's a need, uh, we all do, and that I support that. Uh, I am concerned that this is a lot. Uh, it uh, not only triples the recordation tax premium for homes over a million dollars, but it significantly increases the original proposal in particular for homes between 600 and a million. And that's what I was most concerned about when I was crafting my proposal. For many families, for most families in Montgomery County, a home at $601,000 is a home they might struggle to afford, but they also will struggle to find that actually meets the needs uh, of their family. I think that's still true at 700,000, unfortunately. It's still true at 800,000. There are few places to find housing that serves families in Montgomery County that is below that number. Unfortunately, that's the reality that we face, and unfortunately, uh, it's, it's the reality uh, that we're in. Also, as noted, uh, if the primary purpose of increasing the recordation tax is to fund school construction, which has been the prevailing conversation that we have been having and the badly needed PILAR projects and other projects that we have within the school's CIP, I think we should be steering this increase to the extent we can to schools because that is the stated uh, purpose. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the original planning board proposal that the prior council ultimately did not uh, take up. I'll note that the proposal that is now the lutke Balcom Amendment um, which I'm very proud and prefer it to be the Lukey Balcom Amendment, frankly. Um, that proposal is more progressive than the planning board's original proposal. It doesn't touch any homes under 600,000. It is very similar between 600,000 and a million in many areas of, of that. It's actually virtually identical in terms of the revenue that it would generate. And it is more once you get over 1.2 million. So less below 600,000, similar between 600,000 and 1.2 million, and actually more than the original planning board recommendation uh, would have been uh, for over 1.2 million and somewhat similar between a million and 1.2 uh, million. I just wanted to note that because it's important for context. Uh, these are significant proposals, even if we move forward uh, with the proposal uh, that is before us uh, in this uh, amendment, it would be to take a more progressive version of what the original planning board proposal that is the basis uh, of much of uh, this uh, conversation. I appreciate uh, Council Members Lukey and, 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 and Balcom uh, mentioning the need to raise revenue, but that we can't just tax our way out of our challenges, that our decisions have a direct impact on housing affordability. And I really appreciate the acknowledgement by Council Member Alvernaz and Balcom uh, that we don't make these decisions in a vacuum. By all accounts, we're heading towards 
challenging fiscal realities and economic realities. We have a 10% property tax proposal uh, before us. We have impact taxes that are supposed to go up uh, by uh, a, a lot. Uh, and as colleagues have eloquently and passionately noted, uh, we just can't get blood out of a turnip. So uh, I appreciate uh, that we're going to move forward with something today. I hope that it is uh, something that is uh, reasonable and can be absorbed without having disproportionate impacts on uh, many people uh, in, in our community in terms of housing affordability. And uh, for all those reasons, I will support the amendment. Thank you, Vice President Friedson. So uh, I'll share my thoughts on this amendment and on the, the broader conversation as well. Um, uh, appreciate the bill sponsor um, and co-sponsor for putting forward uh, this proposal and uh, my uh, appreciation to GEO Chair Stewart uh, for tweaking it um, to get it to the place where it's at today. But where it's at today is really important to keep in mind as to where it was a few years ago. You know, this is a conversation that's been lingering for years. When the council took up the growth and infrastructure policy in 2020, the council, and I believe every member of the council said that while at that point in time we were not picking up the recordation tax as proposed by the planning board, um, we were going to come back to it. And it's really important to note that during the growth and in infrastructure policy, the planning board came forward with a proposal that we did not adopt. And that proposal, in some respects, is more aggressive than the proposals we're talking about now. And that is from our planning board, who wants growth, who wants infrastructure, and they want housing. We didn't adopt their proposal. And by my understanding, we have lost $40 million in our CIP over those years. Dr. Orlin is nodding. Correct. Okay. That $40 million would have resulted in two additions or nearly three quarters of a new middle school just over the last three years of us not adopting what the planning board recommended. It's important to state that again, the planning board's recommendations, which we did not adopt, which we said we would pick up and we never did. And during that time, I've heard from parents and residents who are concerned about the state of their schools, concerned about their classrooms, and here we are having this conversation. I think it's also important, I'm gonna ask Dr. Orlin, if you look, if we look at the CIP and look at where the funding is needed, what's in the queue, can you share with us the projects that are in the queue and the projects that would probably benefit the most from an infusion of build uh, of construction funding? Well, there's two ways I could answer. I guess the question is, is in comparison to not having a bill or in comparison to Mr. Friesen's bill. Are they different answers? Yes, they're different answers because Mr. Friesen's bill does fund, basically funds the school's requests, uh, but does not fund really anything else. Uh, the without Mr. Friesen's bill, if you compare it to existing rates, then the school's request isn't funded either. So that's why I say I, so, so two different lists. No, I appreciate on, the clarification. So let's go from status quo to uh, passing either bill. Okay, so on school side, um, some of the projects that would be delayed um, that uh, were the non-recommended cuts. Um, let's see, I made a list here actually. Um, uh, Magruder High School uh, would be delayed one year. Um, Damascus High School would be delayed two years. A Highland View Elementary School addition would be delayed two years. Uh, there would be uh, reductions in ADA compliance and roof replacement and the sustainability initiatives within the schools. Um, in non-school projects, and this is what really is affected by the difference between Mr. Friesen's bill and, Mr. and the GEO Committee's bill, uh, the uh, Capital Crescent Trail Tunnel, uh, which recall uh, the executive did not include any money in the CIP for and it's effectively delayed it by three, three years or more from what it is. What the committee and the council has done so far is to, uh, for the time being at least, assume we're going to get a raised grant from the federal government 
but we need to match it with $24 million of county money. And we also, we at the council accelerated it one year from what it had been in the approved CIP because uh, it wasn't matching up with when the purple line is being delivered. So that's $24 million right there. That basically, the project, instead of being accelerated by one year, would be delayed three years or more. Um, the Bradley Boulevard Improvements Project would be delayed by a year. Uh, the Falls Road uh, Bikeway Project by two years. The Forest Lane Passageway by a year. The uh, Tucker Lane Sidewalk uh, Phase 2 by a year. Um, the uh, 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 Summit Avenue Extended uh, in Kensington by a year. Um, the White Flint uh, Fire Station by two years. The Outdoor uh, Firearms Training Facility by one year. Uh, I believe that, I'm not quite sure about this one, I believe the Chevy Chase lay, uh, Library and relocation and um, renovation would be two years and $3 million in legacy open space. And I think there were one or two others which I don't have listed, which I don't recall. Uh, but that's that's most of what's... I, what I started to take notes, but it became too long a list for me to keep yeah. up with you. But what I heard was that based on both proposals, um, schools like Magruder and Damascus will get the funding they need. Yes. Great. Um, but the difference between the two proposals, if we go with the GO committee recommendation, then the Capitol Crescent Trail, Bradley Boulevard, Falls Road, and Tuckerman will be built uh, in a quicker pace than the alternative. Right. And but also don't forget about the rental assistance. The difference between Mr. Friedson's proposal would add two and a half million dollars over the five year period. The uh, GO committees would add 52 million. Okay. So that's the major difference there. Um, I, I appreciate this. This is illuminating. Um, these are the details I think that are important in, in determining which way to go. Uh, I throw this out there for, for consideration at a future time that uh, while we're facing the situation, uh, because of budgetary constraints, but also because of inflationary costs, uh, perhaps we revisit this at some future time, peg it to inflation uh, so that we don't have to keep revisiting this conversation making these very tough decisions, uh, but recognizing the, uh, the external economic realities uh, that exist with, with property values. Uh, could Mr. could I, well, I've got so, partly have the floor, could I make one point for the record? Uh, I heard references to how the uh, recordation tax under the GEO Committee's proposal would, would triple or go up to by 200%, which is the same thing, and that's true in terms of the rate. That's not true with, the, with what people would be paying in recordation tax. If you look at the top of page eight of the packet, uh, you'll see a table which shows uh, four scenarios, the existing rates, the rates under the Mink Jawando the bill, the rates under the GEO Committee's recommendations, and the rates under the Friesen proposal. Uh, for a $1 million house uh, under the GEO Committee's recommendation, they would pay $3,050 more, which is a, not a 200% a increase, but a 30% increase. Um, for a million and a half, uh, dollar house, it would not be uh, a 200 percent increase, it would be a 45 percent increase, it's much different. Uh, under Friedson proposal, it would be a uh, 10 percent, 11 percent increase uh, for a million dollar house and a 24 percent increase under the um, uh, 1.5 million scenario. So I just don't want anybody to leave the impression with anybody who's listening to this that the rates, the recordation taxes are going to triple. Plus everything on page eight, what you're seeing there in terms of the dollars of uh, typically, that is split between the buyer and the seller. So a buyer would be paying only half of this in 90% of the time. Thank you, Dr. Thank Owen. You. Uh, Council Member Albernas. Thank you, Dr. Owen. You, you probably haven't had a chance to evaluate this because we just got um, news that the impact taxes and the transportation impact taxes have been increased. But um, what that's different, that's in addition to. So, can you talk a little bit about what your initial assess the assessment is of? regardless of what we do, what that increase will be? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this sort of informally, um, uh, internally here so far, but nothing come up with a specific proposal. Um, but um, yes, the the transportation impact tax, as calculated by the finance department, is 9.5% uh, over t over the two-year period. The way, the way the law, boy, this is, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, so you have a few minutes. The way the law was intended several years ago was that uh, rather than having the council having to revisit the impact tax rates every year to deal with inflation, that there would be a process where automatically finance would increase it um, by the cumulative effect of the prior two calendar years. 
Um, and that was the way it was supposed to be applied to schools and for transportation. And then a couple of years ago for schools, it was changed to take into account not a construction cost infl uh, index, but what the school system was actually uh, uh, experiencing with their increases, and also took into account the student generation rate. And that was, and they looked, and they still do that now, they look at the cumulative over two years. Um, typically, these increases have been relatively modest, maybe in the you know, 10, 15 percent range. Again, that sounds high, but it's over a two-year period. That doesn't sound so bad. Uh, this year, the rates, depending for schools, depending on the type of unit and whether it's in an in, a turnover area or an infill area, can range anywhere from the low 40s to the generally upper 70s, but there's one outlier, which is the multifamily and turnover areas, which is going up back about 130 percent. Okay? This is what the math tells us. Uh, and the way the process works is that finance on May 1st, as they just did, uh, uh, published th that in the, in the record, uh, in the register, to get comments. But then, unless there's some huge mistake in the way the math's done, uh, these with rates would go into effect as of July 1st. On transportation, the increases, uh, as was calculated, was 9.5%. But I'll say it right now, I'll make it publicly. This, there was a mistake in the way the law was written. I'll just say it. Uh, the law was supposed to take into account the cumulative impact over two prior calendar years. What the law actually says is that you take look two prior calendar years and you average it over those two years. So 9.5% is not the cumulative increase in construction index from January of 2021 through January 2023. It's actually the average of the two years was actually more like 6% in the first of those two years and 12% in the second two years. What it should have been was 19.5%. And so I'll throw it out there. Uh, my suggestion is to do two things. To change the law to put a cap on how much an inflationary adjustment ought to occur in any biennial year. And there needs to be some details to how that works out. But on the second point, change the way the transportation impact tax law reads to really for it to be cumulative. And if you did that, if you did both of those things, you'd bring, uh, you'd maintain the philosophy of school impact taxes and transportation impact taxes, that new development pays for its fair share of the cost of the uh, students and the traffic that it's generating. Uh, now this is a big issue, it's, it's coming on very quickly. If you're going to do this thing and I come effective July 1st, you need to have a bill introduced before you go on recess, have the public hearing when you get back, probably on June 13th, I think it's your first day, have a geo committee meeting and then a, a full council action for the end of June. It would need to be an expedited bill and it'd be have the kind of thing where if in fact there was total agreement or enough agreement that the county executive would um, uh, sign that without using his entire 10 days so it actually can be going into effect as of July 1st when otherwise these rates will go into effect. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, it's not for today, obviously, but it's it's a lot more. Maybe you, I opened a can of worms here. Maybe you have for me. I'm not sure. But um, it is, it, it is. I'm sure it's going to be a real issue. And I've actually, and you probably have heard as well. I've heard from the development committee already. They're they're kind of losing it about about the, the situation. Thanks. So the, they're losing it about a lot of situations right now. Um, so I guess the, um, obviously that is new information and clearly something we're gonna have to follow up on as soon as possible, but underwrites my concern that what we're about to do has to be looked at in totality. Um, and, and that's why I'm just, you know, even if we can lower it a little bit, um, I think it would help. I, so- Could I, with, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Beck, remind me, I should really say this. The CIP that the executive sent over in terms of the impact tax rates uh, actually assumed this. They assumed a 50% increase in the rates for schools and a 9.5% increase in rates for transportation. I'm sorry, I just needed to make sure I got that out. Thank you. I uh, yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. Uh, appreciate this robust discussion. I just wanted to point out a couple of things I think that are really important. Um, you mentioned, Dr. Orland, the $40 million that was foregone that Council President, uh, that was the change because of the impact tax change, correct? That was the change by not having the um, recordation tax that was proposed by the planning so board. So that approved. was based on the planning boards. If you if we had implemented the planning board's numbers at that time, it would have generated for 40 million 
dollars. Yeah, over the last two years, total right. over the last and two so that, years. So that takes into account the, the, that would have caught the housing boom that happened, the sales that happened in 2020 and, and, and the like. Right, 2021 and 2023 have been down years. Ms. Lukey is right, it's very fluctu fluctuating. Uh, revenue source 2022 was a banner year. Right. We collected more money that year than any other year that I can remember. I appreciate that. And, and, uh, and as I was mentioning with the opportunity cost, the other thing I wanted to mention, which you alluded to, but just wanted to put some numbers on it, you know, for a million dollar home, current, you currently pay $10,300 on split between two 90 percent of the time which is about five thousand one hundred and fifty dollars give or take under the proposal that councilmember stewart and others put together it would go up to thirteen thousand three hundred sixty which is a three thousand dollar increase again split to two fifteen hundred dollars um yeah, that's a zero point one five increase in my on a million dollar home of the sale of the home so if you a million i did my math right you can check it um so the, if you take three thousand dollars of a million that's 0.3 half of that is 0.15 people are not making a decision whether to buy a million dollar home based on that they're just not and um i think it's important to have that context that doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact or it's not something that's real uh, but to Councilmember Sales points, which she made very passionately, uh, you know, we have to to contribute to the community that we want to see and build it. Um, and I happily will do will do that. I know many will, um, especially when we created the deficit. So I just think the context of of that very small amount on the transaction that is split between two are not driving decisions to purchase a home. So thank you. Okay, colleagues, we have uh, an amendment on the floor. It's the Ludke Balcom Friedson uh, Amendment. Um, all those in favor of that amendment, raise your hand. That is four. All those opposed? And that motion fails. And not seeing any other comments on the underlying piece of legislation, um, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Councilmember Ludke? No. Councilmember Loki votes no. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? No. Councilmember Albernaz votes no. Councilmember Duwando? Yes. Councilmember Duwando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? No. Councilmember Balcom votes no. Councilmember Friedson? No. Councilmember Friedson votes no. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Okay, and that passes seven to four. So, moving off of a legislative session, we are now going to move into work sessions on the FY24 budget. Our second day of full council conversations about the committee recommendations that have been made over the last two weeks. Uh, and to this morning, we will go through a number of items, mostly in the public safety committee sphere. Um, and I will turn it over. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, FY24 operating NCIP amendments. And I will turn it over to Chair Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I was going to say, I think, thank you very much, Mr. President. This is, this is uh, uh, a difficult budget, as we've all learned. And, and I know the police chief and his, and his staff are here as well. Perhaps the chief would want to come down and anyone who he would like to have come down with him. I think we need to frame this discussion with a, with a reminder. And the reminder is that we are at least, underline the words, at least 108 officers short. And, um, it, and it's like everything else, you know, we, we, uh, we, because of the $20,000 signing bonus, we've started to get more and more people who, will, who are applying for the position. Being a police officer has never been an easy job. It's certainly become even more difficult if that was possible. But we need to keep in mind 
that because of the shortages that we have in the police department, that air response time for someone when they call uh, 911, and obviously this is an average time, if, if there's a, a horrible situation, obviously it's faster than this, but the average response time is about nine minutes and 20 seconds. Nine minutes and 20 seconds, and that's 44 seconds longer than last year's average. And as we all know, when you're waiting for that important uh, person to come to come help you, every second seems like a month, and and we have got to try. Um, we have got to try to figure out what's a better way to solve this while we are getting additional officers and we are all working towards that. But most of the additional time, most of the additional time or about 41 seconds of those 44 seconds is involving unit travel time to the incident. And that says quite a bit. So that's why when we went through this, and, and obviously, we are very concerned in every way, but one of the ways that we can, can, uh, can uh, help the more safe and effective policing <coughs> is to, in some ways, get some additional civil, uh, civilizing the certain police functions. And that's why we are attempting to turn to technology. Perfect, not always, but that is what we've considered. And and I think, and we can go through each, and, and Ms. Frog is here and is, as always has done a wonderful job but on this packet, but I think we need to keep in mind why we have suggested what we have suggested and the high priorities and the priorities. We've had, we've had some uh, uh, discussions about, and we're gonna hear it later, and I know, but about the drone about uh, civilian firearm instructors, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it is important that the, that the chief and his staff are given the training and the technology that are so very necessary to make, make certain that Montgomery County remains safe. We are, you know, we hear people, and of course every, every crime is a, is a horrible situation. We don't want any crime. But the reality is you're gonna have it when you have a, a million population. And the reality is that we want to make certain that we get back to being as safe an area. And I think we still are the, the safest and the, the, the experts are sitting at that, at that table. Uh, I think we are the safest in the Washington metropolitan area, but that doesn't mean that we, that we feel as safe as we should be. So I'm gonna, if it's with you, uh, if it's all right with you, Ms. Council President, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Frog. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Um, as the Chair of Public Safety indicated, the committee reviewed this budget through a context of significant police and civilian staff shortages. There's about an 8% re um, shortage of sworn officers and up to an 18% shortage of civilian staffing, professional staffing, and a large chunk of that is in the Emergency Communications 911 call center. Um, uh, lay this against the landscape of increasing violent crime. Certain subsets of violent crime continue to increase and violent crime is up 7% in the first quarter of, of calendar 2023. Um, the county executive's recommended budget adds several, um, the actual recommended budget is $317 million, that 7% increase over the approved budget from last year. It actually results in a net service reduction. Most of that increase is going to fund compensation which is, in my opinion, necessary. Um, however, the service reduction comes from the fact that you're so short-staffed at this point. And again, the Chair of Public Safety mentioned that calls for, you know, the, the response time to calls has increased since last year, and part of that is reduced staffing. Um, so the County Executive's uh, recommended budget adds several items that policymakers across the country are looking at right now because everybody's suffering a police shortage. Right, um, you know, there was a huge number of police officers hired in the 90s when crime was at its highest. They are all now retirement eligible, so they're leaving. So a couple of the biggest things that policymakers are looking at are civilianizing police functions so that it can free up sworn officers to go respond to calls 
And additionally, as the chair mentioned, looking at technology improvements to augment um, services and act as force multipliers. So the county, um, the committee, when they re went through these uh, recommendations, they voted 3-0 to, sp to split the six civilian firearms instructor positions into two tranches, one of those staying on high priority and one of those on priority. And they added one-time funding for the Violent Crime Information Center to maintain operations through the end of FY24. The committee also voted 2-1 with Chair Katz opposed to cut the security camera rebate program funding by half, assuming a January 1st start date. And I'm happy to go through the um, items on the reconciliation list on page two. Um, the first item for your consideration is adding three civilian firearms instructors tranche one for $233,000. Again, the other item is on the priority list. The, the department currently has six sworn and three civilian firearms instructors. Um, civilianizing this type of function would again free up sworn officers to answer calls. Um, and it also could take advantage of recently retired police officers from other agencies who would be able to provide the firearms instruction. The second item is to enhance one-time replacement security and precision rifles. Uh, these rifles are past their end of life. Um, they're having trouble getting parts for some of them. Uh, when the rifles get too old, there can be a degradation in both accuracy and reliability. The next item is adding a drone as a first responder pilot project for $250,000. This is different than the department's current drone program, which is more you know, supporting SWAT and that, those types of operations. This would act as a first responder, and it's a pilot project. If it works the way it's supposed to work, it will actually, again, free up police officers to respond to other calls. And one of the programs they've looked at closely is the Chula Vista program, and that program has helped to avert the need for 300 police officers to respond to, call, to different calls. Um, the next item is replacing 100 car in-car printers for 200,000. Those are the ETIX printers for issuing warnings or citations for traffic stops. The next item is replacing motor, six motorcycles for $181,000. They have about 28, 29 motorcycles currently in the fleet. Um, the newer motorcycles have sa are safer. They're actually more fuel efficient. They're deemed more reliable and they have better warranties. The next item is replacing night vision goggles and scopes for $172,000. That will enable police officers um, engaged in night operations to see much more clearly and that clearer um, vision and view actually brings safety both to the police officers, the suspect, and any bystanders in an incident. The next one is adding a police survey platform for $100,000. This is required by the council's bill 4520 that requires annual reporting back to council. This would provide a survey platform that allows the department to survey both civilian citizens in the community as well as police officers themselves and report that data back. The next ad is a program manager three for officer wellness for $92,000. This position is supposed to help consolidate the variety of wellness programs they have in the department right now. Um, some of the committee discussion about this sur surrounding this program said that um, bargaining was mandatory for this. It is mandatory for mandatory wellness programs. For voluntary wellness programs, it's not. And additionally, there's more than just um, FOP represented individuals who are taking advantage of these wellness programs. It includes Lieutenant and Up, which is man police management, as well as non-civilian non professional staff. Um, adding four crossing guards, these are all part-time positions. Two would be deployed to a new elementary school that is supposed to open next year, and two would be deployed to enhance current um, safety at schools. Adding the civilian curriculum developer is about 78,000. This is another uh, response to the ELE phrase final audit on the police department police reform. This would provide um, a subject matter expert who is providing the best evidence-based training programs to the department. And it also provides continuity of operations because right now the director of the training academy is a captain and captains are generally rotated every few years, three to five years to different assignments. Um, so this would provide um, subject matter expertise and continuity of operations at the training academy. Um, 
adding camera rebate program funding, the initial request for, or the initial inclusion of this was 511,000. And again, that funds the um, council's bill to provide a security camera rebate program. Um, the department has drafted draft regulations and they have been advertised. We have not received them yet. So I don't know what their priority areas are and that type of operational need before they can actually implement the program. So the committee assumed that they would be ready for a January 1st start date and cut that funding in half. And the Violent Crime Information Center funding, this was an initiative that was funded initially through ARPA funds last year, last June, and their funding will carry them through December of this year. It is not enough to carry them through all of FY24. And this is using two crime analysts, civilian crime analysts, who are looking at license plate camera data, um, live camera feeds, and other technology and data, and helping police real time to um, solve issues. And it, 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 it helps make police time, detective time, more efficient, and again, frees up officers to go answer other calls for service. And you know, we already talked about the civilian firearms instructors. Uh, Obviously, police department is here and can answer any specific questions you have about any of their programs. Thank you very much, Ms. Farag and uh, Mr. Chair of Public Safety Committee, Councilmember Katz. Uh, appreciate the work that you and your colleagues uh, did for this budget. Uh, Councilmember Mink. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Chair Katz, for uh, walking us through this budget. Um, and Councilmember Ludke, we had some good conversations. Um, there's, I wanted to, you know, as we are all going through our relative committee recommendations, um, and with much appreciation for everybody doing their due diligence as much as possible to find where we can. Um, uh, where we can wait on some things, where we can find some cuts given our very tough circumstances. Um, I'm going to attempt to do the same and uh, look forward to a, a conversation with colleagues here. Um, so the drone program, uh, I sent out a, a memo yesterday about it, so I wanted to bring that one up for discussion, um, uh, making a motion to, uh, to remove that from the reconciliation list at this time. Um, so as Ms. Farag outlined, the proposal before us is to pilot a new drone program. We have some drones, this is for a new one, called the Drone as First Responder Program um, for a starting cost of a quarter of a million dollars. Um, while drones are becoming more common across the country, drone as first responder programs are still relatively rare. Um, and in these programs, um, and, and I say this for the public also, drones are stationed on rooftops uh, to respond to 911 calls, often getting there more quickly than officers can and provide aerial observation. Um, they may tail a suspect or someone the operator believes to be a suspect, and they record video that may or may not become part of an investigation or a prosecution. And so the proposed pilot program uh, would station one first responder drone on a rooftop in downtown Silver Spring, then with the goal to expand in the future if successful. Um, so a drone is first responder program, to be clear, would dramatically increase the scope of police work done by drones in Montgomery County. Uh, an article about the Chula Vista Police Department, as uh, cited by Ms. Farag, noted that in Chula Vista, uh, quote, it's not uncommon to see an unmanned aerial vehicle darting across the sky. And I note that because our residents are clearly going to notice this program, and they should. Uh, in fact, they should, uh, they should have a say in it. Um, and so to be clear, I'm not saying that we should never do this. Um, I'm s saying that the groundwork perhaps has not been done yet for us to be ready to do this right now. Um, from what I have seen, a drone as first responder program has legitimate potential safety benefits both to the public and to first responders. Um, it also carries legitimate civil liberty, privacy, and other policy concerns. Uh, community engagement, engagement to understand how the public does and doesn't want drones used by the, their government is essential. This is going to be a better program also if we have buy-in from the community. Uh, and as the public's representatives, uh, the council should have the opportunity to analyze that public input and use it to review and approve departmental policies prior to funding any new drone programs. Um, I did want to note, uh, as I mentioned in my memo, that Maryland state law preempts us from legislating drone operations. Um, it's my feeling that that makes it all the more essential for us to engage the public prior to making related funding decisions. Um, as we struggle to meet budget demands for food hubs, 
emergency housing school system, I would like to suggest that we table the $250,000 drone pilot program, of which most of our constituents are unaware. Um, noting also that uh, FOP, Lodge 35, opposes this item as well. Um, it is my belief that until community engagement can inform the council's review and approval of the relevant departmental policies, in the 2014 words of uh, Ike Leggett, when he was considering drone use prior to public discussion having taken place, uh, this is not ready for prime time. And so I, I leave that up for discussion. Thank okay. you. Okay, so Council Member Mink moves to uh, eliminate the $250,000 drone pilot program. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Okay, seconded by Council Member Balcom. Um, comments, uh, Council Member Ludke. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, inherent in the discussion and question related to the budgeting of this and, and to the motion that was just made um, are implications that the drone use of drone technology in this fashion is somehow unconstitutional or, or violative of civil liberties, which is wholly incorrect. Um, during our committee hearing, I did my best to explain that this is not new or novel and that there is established constitutional analysis and protections for not only using the drones, but how the data associated with them is protected. Um, you've already talked about the program in Chula Vista. There's also programs in Santa Monica and in Beverly Hills. And um, I know that MCPD has folks who are actively collaborating with and learning best practices from those departments in the operation of their drone as first responder program, which I note California being in the Ninth Circuit, which is widely regarded as the most liberal of all the federal appellate courts, and has not said that this is unconstitutional or violative of civil liberties. Um, so we already have a drone program. This is a specific issue for a specific device to be used in a certain way. Um, and as noted by Ms. Farag, violent crime is up 7% just in the first quarter of 2023. Why would we choose to do anything that handicaps our ability to reduce, prevent, and respond to incidents of crime? Um, you know, it helps to de-escalate situations. It will help to increase public safety, be more efficient, save money. As noted um, at, in Chula Vista, it helps having the drone as first responder helps reduce the number of people required to respond to surround an area where there is a significant incident. And um, we've had a rather busy weekend in media news here with uh, active assailants, both you know in the shooting that occurred down in Annapolis in parole and uh, the multitude of those occurring around the country. And I think some of you know that I actively participated with our state's active assailant interdisciplinary work group and I chaired its prevention subcommittee. Think about Las Vegas. Think about the, the mass carnage that happened in Las Vegas. Wouldn't it have been much easier to have responded and to target where the shooter was if you'd had an unmanned drone? that could give you that information so that you could get to the accurate spot. I have watched hours of footage from that incident. It is horrible. So I strongly urge that my colleagues vote against the motion and leave the drone as first responder program in the budget because it is necessary to protect our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Albernos. Thanks. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, so, because first time, you know, all of us are getting to hear about this. So, how long is the pilot? Uh, the pilot will be for one year. One year. Yes. And then, how will you be collecting information, Chief Jones, on the pilot? How will you be uh, tracking its success? Yeah. So there is a computerized program. We will have. Um, we will have each deployment of the drone documented as to uh, to its deployment, um, the purpose of its deployment, um, the length of its deployment, and the results of said deployment. Um, and that will be documented um, even in our current uh, form of our drone program, we produced an annual report for 2022, uh, which would be very similar to what we would do for this uh, drone program, which will be included in our annual uh, drone report. Gotcha. So it's a year. Uh, you'll be collecting information all the way through, 
and there will be an evaluation um, upon completion of that year. That is correct. And just how many officers are we down in that district right now? Um, I think at this point we are uh, probably down approximately 30 officers in the third district. Um, and, you know, again, as we've noted, the third district is one of the districts which we want to utilize. We also want to um, utilize this in the fourth district as well um, in the central business district. So, and in the fourth district, I believe they are down probably approximately 40 plus officers. Um, so this would be a tremendous assistance um, as we deal with those uh, shortages. And is this a 24-7 operation or will it be targeted during specific times of the day or week? Yeah, it would be probably targeted during our highest uh, call, uh, uh, times of uh, volumes of calls for service. Um, generally, probably during mid after, and it can only really fly during the daytime hours. Um, so when evening strikes, uh, we cannot have the drone flying in the, in the, in the, in the darkness. Gotcha. Um, and I appreciate Councilmember Mink's memo. I thought it was very thoughtful and any uh, quotation of my mentor and uh, <laughs> Ike Leggett means a lot to me, but that wasn't, you know, nine years ago. Um, and we, we are in a much different time now than we were then. Um, we were almost fully staffed then. Um, you know, within that particular district police station at the time. And I remember Chief Manger actually explored the feasibility of a helicopter, which uh, the county executive then also uh, did not think was a good time. I think times have changed pretty significantly, and this provides an additional resource and tool um, now that will be evaluated and will give residents an opportunity to react to that evaluation. But I believe um, what's necessary on the ground now and we have been hearing repeatedly, repeatedly from constituents who are expressing concern over just a general feeling of being unsafe. We also uh, just received a memo, now this is in Kensington, but just earlier this week, it took almost four hours um, for police to respond to a 911 call after several 911 calls in which there was an escalated situation in someone's office. And just two months before that, um, I had gone to my local pet shop, uh, and as I walked in, the two young women who were working beyond the behind the counter looked like they'd seen a ghost. They had just been robbed. Uh, this was at 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. So, uh, I, and these are anecdotal stories, I acknowledge that, but they're, they're paired with actual data that suggests that crime rates are higher now. And I think this is a reasonable step a reasonable step for us to address the situation that we see before us and we'll be able to evaluate whether or not it has been effective. Um, and so I, I will not support the motion, although I uh, appreciate and respect where it's coming from, um, because I think we can still achieve community feedback and input, but we'll have even more data from which to be able to have a discussion on that community input after we've seen how it's gone. Thank you. Council Member Balcom. Thank you. I wanted to clarify the uh, seconding the motion had nothing to do with the constitutionality of the drone. And so I just wanted to push back on Council Member Lukey's. Sorry, that was that was meant at the about the memo, the issues raised in the memo that was circulated to Council. That's I also correct. don't don't challenge it on constitutionality. So I just wanted to so I wanted to make that clear um, that I was looking at the um, where we are in the budget and whether this was the best use of uh, funds at this time period. Thank you. Uh, Council, member, Council Member Stewart. Sorry, I didn't think I was up next. <laughs> uh, first, I want to say, Chief and everyone here, um, thank you very much. Thank you for all the work you're doing under very difficult um, situations such as uh, those that Council Member Katz um, discussed um, and I very much appreciate all the work uh, in uh, District 4 particularly in the downtown Silver Spring area where if I understand the way this has been presented is that this this pilot would be in downtown Silver Spring and um, you know I, I appreciate Council, Council Member Albanar is talking about community input because I'm actually hearing from residents because I don't believe um, the Silver Spring uh, Citizens Advisory Board or the Urban District or residents in Silver Spring have been engaged on this issue. 
um, or have it had discussed with them or brought up. And, and so I'm just curious if that's a misunderstanding or have residents in downtown Silver Spring who may be experiencing a, a drone flying around the area during the day, ha have, they been, have they been asked for their input or briefed on this at all? So the uh, overall answer is it's no, but there have been individuals in Silver Spring who have been briefed on this. Um, we've not had necessarily an opportunity to be able to actually get out and do this, but we are prepared to actually go out and to um, inform the community of exactly what we're doing. We are in total transparency in this program. There's nothing for us to be able to, for us to hide here about how this will be deployed. Um, and we're more than welcome to meet with any group. Um, but I think we're moving at a very fast fa pace. Um, we're trying to come up with strategies um, for our community to make them as safe as possible um, during this time as noted about the increased violence that's been occurring in the county. And for example, we've been putting up uh, mobile video cameras um, throughout downtown Silver Spring, and we didn't have those conversations with the community when we did that. But at the same time, we did after we, after we put them up. Um, and, and the other part of that is, is the fact that um, we have seen, for example, where we put those up and we had numerous um, incidents of carjackings. We've not had those carjackings since we put those mobile video cameras up in those areas. So, okay. yes, well, Chief, not going wood, but I, may, I though, take my wins where I can. Yes, Chief, yes. I very much appreciate that, but I, I do have to note that particularly Commander McBain and Captain Reed had done an excellent job, and the community has been briefed on, on, the, on where the cameras were going, when you move them, and unfortunately, when one of the cameras were moved from, the Bonnet, from Benton and Bonifant, we did have a carjacking the next day. Um, the residents in downtown Silver Spring have been asking, um, as my office has, for more cameras, particularly also in parking garages, in the stairwells, and other things. And that has been an ongoing conversation with the residents. And I fully appreciate that and appreciate the job that you're doing and Commander McBade and Captain Reed are doing, keeping residents engaged in this process. And I think that's very important. My, my concern here is that this is the $250,000, as Council Member Balcom talked about. Um, and I, I think I'm going to support the kind of the I don't know if you want to call it a pause on this as we continue to explore this and talk to members of the community and move forward with it. Because uh, I appreciate that you've talked to some people in the district. As, as the district councilwoman, I have not been engaged in the process either. And so at this point, when we're having this difficult discussion about our budget um, for this portion of it, I'm going to support uh, either pausing it or putting it on the priority list, whatever the motion is. The motion is to remove it. I'll, I'll agree to remove it. Okay. Uh, Chairman Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. If I could, uh, could I ask Ms. Farag to please jump in here? And then I, I'm going to come right back to it. Please. Yes, I just wanted to offer one thing for the Council's consideration when reaching out to community members. Part of my uh, initial staff report was in equity. Um, was on equity focus areas and to show that people do not experience safety in this county equally. Um, there's a huge disproportionate impact to people who live in equity focus areas. So when, and this is meant to help avert some of the violent crime that are, is happening in equity focus areas. And I sent this to the public safety chair, but when I was looking at total homicides across the past seven years, they have started to concentrate significantly in these EFAs. Um, in 2017, they were 37.5% of all homicides in the county for that year. This year alone, they are 60% of all homicides are happening in an area that covers 8% of the square mileage of this county and impacts 28% of the residents of this county. So when you look to talk to stakeholders, I would suggest trying to proactively reach out to people who live in equity focus areas that may not be necessarily the regular community and residence associations that we deal with. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Frog. Uh, you know, this is really becomes down to the chicken and the egg. In one breath, and I believe we absolutely need to involve Air Public for as many steps of the way as we can, but at some point, if something is not in the budget, 
how in the world can we go out to the public and say, you know what, it would be nice to have, because it's not in the budget. We can't, they, the police department shouldn't, that doesn't go out and say, you know, this is something that, that we should fund, but we don't have any funds for it. It's, it's not, to me, that's not the way to go about it. I believe what we should do is put this in the budget. I believe what we should do at that point, we should have the discussions, the police department and others, I'm happy to go there as well, uh, and with, with you and everyone else, to have those discussions with the public and in here what what ideas good ideas they have and what they what they uh, agree with and disagree with and and to the point about ike uh, county executive leggett's uh 2014 statement he was right it wasn't ready for prime time in 2014. in 2015 county executive leggett and others uh we started the montgomery county or they started the montgomery county pilot program for body-worn cameras since that time, there's not a, I bet there's not 90% of the public doesn't have a video camera with them at all times. That's exactly what we have. The, the, the world has changed. We have body-worn cameras. Uh, everybody in a, in a walking down the street has a, has a video. I mean, and, and it's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. But I appreciate the fact that $250,000 is a lot of money. But when we're this short of police officers, we have to do something to alleviate that as best we can and have the discussions. I'm not suggesting that we don't, but we have got to alleviate the very real concerns of not having the, the, the response times, what we need to have. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to remind my colleagues just a time check. It's 1130. We have a lot of other items on the budget, and we have people here to discuss those items. Uh, Council Member Fanny Gonzalez. I'm going to make it quick. Um, I want to start by saying I adore, maybe not the right word to say, but I adore Captain Smith for Police <laughs> District 4, which is actually County Council District 6. Um, he has been phenomenal and I uh, have done quite a few things, um, uh, engagement activities with him in, in local businesses and local uh, uh, neighborhoods, and he has been excellent, and I, I wanted you to know that publicly. Um, I will say, I it's not like I don't agree with this program, I do, but I will say that first, I'm gonna, do, uh, I'm gonna be doing a public safety community meeting, targeting people who actually, uh, following on the staff uh, comment, those are the people I talk to. I don't just talk to civic associations, you know, the the same people that usually come here and propose everything. Um, I go out and talk to actually residents, and I, I will hold a public safety town hall, uh, so stay tuned on that one, and this will be one of the issues. We already have a drones in, in the county. I would like to have an understanding of how that work has resulted, you know, with the drones that you currently have, and then make a case for this new generation of drones that you're proposing. I don't think we should do this this year, um, not only because of the lack of, of communication on this, on, on the intention, but also the lack of money. We cannot afford every single project that is coming in front of us, and that's a reality. Um, so that has a lot to do with my decision that we should be deleting this for now, and maybe come back next year. Uh, in the meantime, maybe having these public engagements uh, uh, meetings to understand what the implications are um, and move forward. So, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. I appreciate the discussion. There, how many drones are in effect or in use right now? What are, what are their primary usage, Chief Jones? So, the primary usage of our drones currently are uh, we utilize our drones for uh, missing persons. Um, so it's, it's, it's a help for, for searches. Um, we also utilize um, our drones to help us at major events, um, to help us to uh, actually prepare for, the, for said events when we know that we have large uh, volumes of people that will be gathering. Um, and it's, it's more from a safety um, um, a situation from that perspective. Um, I'd also note that uh, we utilize them um, in a variety of other different facets. For example, 
Um, we've utilized them for um, uh, to help with our emergency response teams when they go out uh, on dangerous uh, different uh, operations in order to for oper for for officer safety. And again, all of those incidents are documented, um, and we prepared those in. And again, we've done a twenty. Uh, we've done an annual report on the uh, actual um, deployment of all of our drones in those particular uh, situations. Okay. And how many, uh, roughly? Is it 13? I've heard, 13. The, I've heard the number 13. 13 okay, I just yes. want to get that on. I appreciate right. it. Um, so obviously different uses than what's being proposed here. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'd want to know more similar to colleagues' uh, comments about uh, the community engagement process, I think it's really important because this will be a different usage and, and much more often. Um, I think also, I think the council should be, you know, up to date and involved, Not, and I don't know if the committee is, I, I, I didn't see this discussed, but in the, what the specific procedures are going to be as far as how it's used, uh, all, when it's used, what's done with the footage, how you're going to be uh, just documenting or think, you know, using it and determining whether it's been successful or not. Um, all of those things I think we need to have a little more information on um, before we uh, jump in and do it right away. Um, I also would say that uh, it is a tight budget, and uh, I think that's not an insignificant uh, issue here that's being raised by colleagues. So. So I'm inclined to support the motion at this time, but I do think we should get, you know, if this is something, I know this is relatively new across the country, I'd like to have further conversation about how, what the procedures and policies and where it's gonna be used, because there's always an, an issue here to Ms. Farag's point, you know, where there is concentrated crime or concentrated poverty, uh, there's an opportunity here or that these could be used in specific areas more often than not, and there needs to be just real thoughtfulness about that, about what the unintended consequences could be and as what the benefits could be. Well, if I could just state, the, the drone program is regulated by the FAA. We can't just fly wherever we so choose to fly. And so in the pilot program, we got special permission to actually be able to fly in the Silver Spring Wheaton Corridor, only a two-mile radius. So it's a very small radius. We can't just go to Germantown. We can't go to any other area in the county and fly this. And so we've been more specific. And, and, and just to say to this council, and I totally understand the finances, but this is a pilot. This is our ability to come back to you, to provide you with the necessary information which you're requesting. Much of this which you're asking, we can't answer the questions if we don't we don't have an opportunity to actually um, sort of, you know, practice or just to see how exactly is this. There are policies that we would implement on how, when we would deploy. Are those written down? Do you have those? Yes. We, we, yes. We put, we, put these, we put this together. Has so that been shared with the council? It's not been shared with the council. Okay, so not. I, just, just, to, just to reclaim the time. So I appreciate that. I just think that's an important first step before before we fund something. We need to see what those policies are. When are you gonna pursue? Who are you gonna pursue? Even in those sh small FAA regulated geographic areas. I, I just think that needs more review as well and more community input. So I appreciate that and, and open to those conversations, but at this time, I don't think we should fund it. Thank you, Mr. President. Council Member Sales. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, just wanted to uh, provide a few remarks. Thank you, uh, Chief Jones and company for joining us today. Uh, to talk about this important budget. Um, we also uh, received as a council just yesterday a letter from uh, the president of the FOP also recommending some um, input to the budget cuts and what should be reprioritized as well. Um, thinking about the um, six new firearm instructors and thinking about um, the officers who were hurt on the job and are um, limited in their ability to actually go out into the community to patrol. We can repurpose um, those uh, positions. Um, retired officers can be brought back. Um, so there's some really creative thinking that um, he has shared um, and would be good for um, those officers to um, be in those positions. So. Um, I would agree with the uh, 
recommendations for the um, drones. Yes, with regards to the drone program, um, you know, you do have the 13 that are currently in operation, and it would be helpful to know where those um, geographical um, limited, limited locations um, are, and I think that would be helpful in deciding uh, whether or not we should uh, fund this program. But I do see that the, um, the camera rebate program funding was cut, um, and I would move to put that uh, back into um, the high priority. So, so right now there is a motion. Oh, uh, we're we're discussing the drone program, and the so if you want to hold on to anything yeah, until later. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I agree with uh, Council Member Mink and think we need more input before we can uh, move forward with supporting this budgetary item. Thank Very you. Good. I appreciate that, Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. It's a good discussion. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, discussing the smaller items and uh, less time on the many, many million dollar items, which is one of the unique functions of budget time. But uh, first, uh, I just want to express appreciation, Chief, to the Assistant Chiefs, to uh, the entire police leadership, to all of our officers. It's a very tough time right now. We know we're experiencing a lot of challenges in a lot of parts of the county and you are stretched very thin and so I just want to acknowledge that and appreciate you and uh, all you're doing. Uh, almost all of us um, were at the memorial service for fallen officers last week uh, and uh, I note that uh, to reflect on the sacrifice that's made not only by officers but by their families and many of the families were there with us and they're not experienced in one year or one moment, but throughout the lifetimes of the families who, who they leave behind. So I uh, just wanted to start with that. I'm a little bit torn on this one, to be honest with you. I, uh, on the one hand, uh, we have a department that is stretched very thin, that doesn't have enough officers to do the work that we need to do uh, in order to respond in a way that we want. And I think our residents expect it's not the fault of the officers. It's, uh, you know, we don't have enough horses uh, to, to run the race uh, and uh, any tools that we have that we can use to address that issue I think we should be you know looking into uh, in in a really significant way uh, on the other hand I'm, I tend to be deferential I'm a district council member to the district uh, council member and her uh, points and, and her uh, concerns uh, here uh, so I just have a, a couple questions then perhaps a suggestion the first one is uh, it was noted that this was going to be used either primarily or exclusively in downtown Silver Spring. Could you just confirm that for me? So as I noted earlier, it will be um, primarily in Silver Spring, but we'll also utilize it in the Wheaton Central Business District. Okay. Okay. So uh, somewhat in Wheaton, mostly in, in downtown Silver Spring. Okay. Um, okay. And then uh, there was a question that was raised of who would be staffing the drone operation. Obviously, the, the drone itself is unmanned, uh, although we might need a new terminology for that, by the way, uh, unstaffed. Um, but someone has to manage the data that is being collected in the footage. It, it, who would that be? Would that be a beat officer? Would that be? So no, we have a contractor who would be responsible for the deployment of the drone. Um, and the contractor would also be responsible for um, actually the documentation. This would fall under the direction of Captain Kokinas in the Special Operations Division, uh, which oversees our current drone program. So it will be part of that that they would still be able to document and report out on all said deployments as noted. Appreciate that. So. Um, my humble suggestion might be that we move it to priority from high priority uh, if that would get to uh, a better result but i yield to the 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 the, the, the mover of the motion uh, on that i'd be comfortable moving it to priority noting uh, that it'd be hard to fund in this budget but not signaling that there's no support for the program at all i, I didn't really hear that personally um i'm a little uncomfortable saying that we don't support this at all because I do think it's something that we ought to be pursuing, but I think there are fiscal realities that we have to face and it sounds like there is a little bit more work and more community engagement that could 
be done. And so I just wanted to put that forward and note that I would be comfortable uh, with, with that. Does Council Member Mink accept that friendly amendment? That's fine. Okay. I was going to make that same suggestion. <laughs> Councilmember Katz, you want to get the final word? I do. I, I do. Thank you. I, I believe that's a, a, though I'm not in agreement that, that we should be waiting, I do believe that that's certainly a, a better step than what we were about to take. I also question whether or not we should have something in the budget before we go out to the public to have the discussion. And I think that's a fair it's a fair discussion, not just on this topic, but on every topic that we have. If we, if we don't have it in the budget, how can we go out and discuss whether or not it's a possibility? Um, I also think that, that uh, we should have the, the conversation uh, with, the, with the community as, as quickly as, as we can. And a final statement is I've been told that the uh, current drone program, the one that you have now, actually did start under uh, uh, former county executive Leggett, that, that uh, you guys see some head shaking yes from memories here, that his position changed when technology changed. And if anybody knows council member uh, or county executive Leggett, who I had the pleasure of seeing either two or three times last week, I hadn't seen him forever, so on two or three times last week, he is certainly someone that knows that with times you change. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. And as Councilmember Albernaz uh, just noted to me, we do have a police advisory board. We have a police advisory commission. There's no shortage of community members who want to be engaged in these conversations. And with that, there is a motion to move the $250,000 drone program from high priority to priority. All those in favor? All those against? And that's nine to two. Okay, and that motion passes. Councilmember Mink. Thank you, everybody, <laughs> for indulging. Um, and I and I and I forgot to 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 thank also um, Chief Jones, who has been very helpful as we've been going back and trying to make an informed decision about this. He gave us lots of feedback and information. So with appreciation, um, and I will be happy to share that information with my colleagues as well. Um, okay, really quick, two others that I wanted to bounce off you all. Um, one of them is the program manager for uh, officer wellness, acknowledging that officer wellness is super important. I think that we are all agreed in that. Um, this is a $92,000 line item, um, noting that as also stated in, uh, in the letter from uh, the president of the of FOP Lodge 35, uh, the county started a wellness committee uh, a number of years ago to work on programming, which is also what this program manager is going to do. Um, it came out of bargaining a couple years ago, and so this process um, has already started. There is a joint health and wellness committee that includes members of the FOP as well as um, members of OHR. Um, they kind of put that on pause during COVID, but that is restarting now. The next meeting is at the end of this month, um, and they have been tasked with putting together, uh, again, a program for officer wellness. So to me, it seems premature to uh, create another position um, you know, within MCPD when we have this coming down the pike already. So making a mo uh, motion to um, uh, move that to either eliminate it or move it to priority. If folks are more comfortable, I'll just say move it to priority so we can be quick. Putting okay. that up for conversation. Okay, so Councilmember Mink moves uh, for the wellness position from high priority to priority. Is there a second? Okay, not hearing a second. Oh, no. I was just going to see if the uh, chief well, well, wanted to. Oh, we, we need oh, to second it. Second. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilmember Jawanda. Conversation, Councilmember Jawanda. I'm seconding it for it to be discussed. I, I, I don't think, that, I will comment briefly. I, I thought about this one. I think uh, what I don't like is that the FOP, who'd be, who'd be the main, their members, the main beneficiary of this therapist, don't want it. And I don't like that there's that, in, that issue because the number one cause of death for police officers is suicide as, as our firefighters. So it's a huge issue. Um, and we do need more therapists and more options, but we need it to actually happen. And so I, I, to the extent that I have a question for the chief, it, it would be, you know, where are conversations with, does the, FO, the FOP would need, members would need to be able to use this and it would need to be something that would be being used by rank and file. Uh, could you give us an update about the usage and the conversations with the, the FOP about this item? 
So to Council Member Jawando and to Council Member Mink, with all due respect, um, I believe that the FOP's uh, response in this for this particular position is not genuine. So in 2019, we had an officer who committed suicide on duty. And on that very day, I made a commitment that we would focus on officer wellness. I've been working with the FOP for four years. They've yet to come to the table to help us with wellness for our officers. So for my purpose, and one of the reasons why this position is very important to us is because we believe that officer wellness is vitally important, not only for FOP members, but also for executives officers and our professional staff. And it's not just mental, it's also medical um, to help officers, to help them transition, to get back to work, um, to get them on a healthy path with OMS. We have a very large police department. I have one person in OHR who's responsible for everyone on our department as it relates to their medical well-being and trying to get them back to work and working with OMS and um, risk management as well. And so this is why this position is vitally important. Yes, it is a, as a part of the mental health component, but it's also beyond that. And so that's why this position is being asked for. I appreciate you sharing that. I was at that funeral. It was very sad. I spoke with his family. Many of us were. Um, so I, you've convinced me, and my message to the FOB will be get on board. If you don't like it, make it better. Officers need, the, need, need this use. So I'll, uh, I'm actually going to withdraw my second. I'll withdraw the motion as well, and I appreciate that feedback. Thank you, Chief. Councilmember Brink. I yield. Very good. Any other comments on this uh, on this budget? Okay, not hearing any. All those in favor of this? Let me just of this police budget for FY24. I, sometimes the names, sometimes the descriptions are complex. Um, uh, but all those in favor of the police budget, uh, raise your hand, and that is unanimous. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, AC Frank. Thank you to your team. Yeah. It's my job, I failed. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you to take us through. For all my being a wise guy here, hold on. The PAB. Yep. Um, the Police Accountability Board, as you know, is new. Um, there are no items on any reconciliation list because all of the county executives increase are compensation related. However, due to its significance in police discipline, I thought it was important for the full council to get a briefing on what the Police Accountability Board is doing and their staffing issues. Uh, this was created, it was mandated by the state in the Police Accountability Act of 2021 which withdrew the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. Um, instead, every jurisdiction is required to, re to create a Police Accountability Board as well as an Administrative Charging Committee. And the ACC is the entity that will actually review um, any complaints against police officers that involve a member of the community, whether internal or externally generated. Um, the C MCPD is the largest police department in the county, and that will create the most work for the board. Um, they are not subject to the ACC until July 1st when their collective bargaining uh, agreement expires. We don't have any concept of what type of complaint numbers they're looking at. Ms. Berry did just email me an updated list of the number of complaints they've received over the entirety of their existence now, which I believe is 29. Um, so I can provide that updated information to you. Um, we have Ms. Berry as the executive director. They're supposed to hire an administrative specialist, which they're budgeted for. I don't know what the current status is of that, but I do want to bring to the council's attention if there is a significantly large increase in the number of complaints they have to review. 
Um, they may require additional staffing. The Public Safety Committee is going to monitor this. We may come back. They may come back and discuss it later in the fall or so after they see what the experience is looking like. But they may require additional staffing to, to appropriately handle this type of uh, case volume. Thank you. Uh, obviously, uh, Ms. Frog said it well. The this was a three to zero vote, and you know, as as everyone is saying, we we uh, we don't know for sure exactly what we're going to need, but we think this is a, a good start. I appreciate that, and appreciate uh, Ms. Frog uh, stating that there are no uh, noticeable uh, differences uh, in the budget, just some increased costs. And so, appreciate the work that. Uh, Ms. Barry is doing, um, building the airplane while flying it. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and Councilmember Juwanda has a comment. Just wanted to say you're doing a great job. And I'm a little biased, but I think you've heard, you've heard it from other people. Um, and thank you, Ms. Farrar, for raising that issue about the complaints. I think we will see, an inc as the, the function of the PAB gets more out there, I think we, what we want to see is we want to see that people can come to it. So I'm glad the Public Safety Committee will monitor that. And, and I agree, obviously, with the budget. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Ms. Barry, you want to make a quick comment? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for having me, having the PAB and the ACC. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Farag. Um, so we are, we have made an offer for an SEAA, and hopefully, if everything goes well, we should have somebody in place, hopefully before June, is, um, is what I'm trying to get. Because July 1 is when all the complaints start coming to the ACC. Um, and at that point, we will need somebody there. Um, so we're in the process, and we're also working on the um, special counsel. We're getting closer to getting a special counsel for the ACC um, and the PAB to do that. And um, things are going pretty well so far, it, as you say, <laughs> uh, Mr. President, um, flying it. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's been interesting, and it's been very well um, managed um, a lot of support in the office um, just wanted to make sure that um, you understand um, coming in and getting the support from um, um, Dr. Stoddard's office his um, SEAA has been a rock um, um, and has really been a, a driving force in getting in helping me get the office into where we are today um, and, um, you know, if you guys have a chance to have the tabs in front of you, consider the fact that for me, they have been amazing um, in helping me get the word out because the PAB is, that's, what, that's where they are, right? Is to get the word out and make sure the community is aware of everything that's going on. And TEBS has been an amazing um, um, help in that. And so has um, um, OMB and um, Talia has been great. So just wanna make sure that you understand what's happening with this new office. So thank you very much. Thank you for the brief update, uh, Ms. Barry. I know the Public Safety Committee will further engage after July 1st, and I um, appreciate your work and the members of the board. Uh, so with that, all those in favor of the Police Accountability Board as approved by Public Safety Committee, that is unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Next is the, uh, the fire and rescue. Um, and if I could please invite the, they already had and see that way, firefighters know when to show <laughs> up. Have you noticed that? And I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Farag as we go through. These were 3 O votes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, the proposed uh, recommended budget is $267 million. That's about a 5%. 5.6 percent increase over the approved budget from last year it's adding 11 new full-time equivalent positions these are funded with ESPP funds which I will get into um, shortly um, this was discussed and and like the public safety chair said it was voted 3-0 to recommend the budget as as submitted by the executive it was discussed against the backdrop of the long-term structural overtime deficit that the that the department has been running for at least seven years um, the long time overtime deficit remains at 8.3 million over budget for this year and in fact you've got the supplemental appropriation before you this afternoon for 10.4 million to address that structural overtime and operational deficit um, increase the the county was able to access new funding stream the ESPP funding stream which is a Medicaid plan amendment that allows for 100% federal reimbursement 
of the transport fees for ambulance service that transports Medicaid patients. So in FY24, they're expecting $13 million from this. Um, the 11 new positions that are funded are funded with these ESPP funds. These are not tax supported funds. So they're, we've technically put them on the reconciliation list for transparency purposes. So you understand where the money is going to, but it's not something that could be cut that would save tax supported funding. Um, I am still happy to go through all of the items that are on priority. The one issue that I will bring up for you that you will talk about shortly in Department of General Services budget is part of this shows a $2 million reduction to shift facilities maintenance of volunteer fire stations over to the Department of General Services. Uh, the Public Safety Committee recommended 3-0 to do that, and then the um, Government Operations Committee looked at it and made a made a cut that will actually make this um, shift budget neutral, and they can discuss that in the DGS budget. Um, but just briefly, 15% of the SPP funds will go to volunteers, and there's an additional adjustment to their um, existing EMST funds for $450,000. It adds uniformed community action coordinator and two civilian community action risk reduction specialists, um, one psychologist, and one critical incident stress management manager or SISM manager. It adds an investigator three position to help deal with um, backlogs and in investigating complaints against firefighters, hopefully to return them out to duty faster. It adds an IT specialist for mobile radio systems, a fleet road tech who would be more flexible and be able to fix broken down apparatus more quickly than having them um, go to the shop to be fixed a contract specialist to assist with procurement issues, a civilian diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, which is something that the chief has wanted for several years. And as the results of their own racial equity off, um, audit, this was a recommended position, and an administrative specialist in HR to help with hiring and recruitment and that type of thing. And again, the uh, committee recommended 3-0 to approve as submitted by the executive. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for that report out. Uh, and uh, before anybody has any questions or comments, uh, Chief Goldstein, I just want to say thank you. This is your last budget appearance before us, and um, we appreciate your 33 years of service. Uh, and I know that there's lots of things you're going to miss. This probably is not one of them. Um, <laughs> come in before the council, ask them for your budget. But uh, I, I open the floor for any comments you want to make. Thank you, Council President. Uh, glass and the opportunity to engage with the council and engage with the, the members uh, on the dais there uh, to support the service and to support the service to the community is the honor that I've had um, for the nearly 33 years and the nearly nine years here. So um, thank you. And Susan, along with the Committee Chair Katz has outlined the, the budget uh, as recommended by the executive and the efforts as we have uh, aimed to improve the, the organization and support the services to, to the county. Very good. Well, thank you again. Thank you to your team for the work that you all do. And I know there will be a more recognition and celebration for you um, uh, at a future date. Uh, but not seeing any comments by colleagues, all those in favor of the Fire and Rescue Services budget, raise your hand, and that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> That's your parting gift. <laughs> Chairman Katz, turn it back to you. Uh, turn your microphone on, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The next item that we have is the Outdoor Firearms Training Center. It was also a 3-0, but this one gets a little bit more confusing than it should be. On January 17th, we uh, uh, received from the county executive's uh, side uh, the a CIP amendment to delay the project by two years. Uh, and then on March the 15th, the, the ink wasn't dry at this point, on March the 15th, we got an amendment that superseded the January 17th amendment and pushed the project out another year, reducing the six-year expenditures from 2.2 million to just over a half a million. The committee did not accept that, and, and it was a 3-0 for that. So to keep, we, 
we were okay with the two-year delay, but not the three-year delay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the Public Safety Committee recommendations regarding the CIP for Outdoor Firearms Training Center, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Okay. And good. back to you, Chair. Thank Perhaps. you. You good? Yeah. Uh, the what? <laughs> One more, yeah. and then we'll come back. Yeah, yes. right. okay. Um, the the next one is the White Flint Fire Station, and um, that one was also a proposed amendment to delay construction by one year. Um, and um, and then we got the March fifteenth amendment. It's deja vu all over again to supersede it. The um, we the committee recommended to reject the uh, additional uh, uh, delay and uh, to maintain the current scheduled. Uh, that area is a growing area and uh, it certainly is something that is needed. It was a 3-0 vote. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the FY23 to 28 CIP for the White Flint Fire Station as recommended by Public Safety, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Don't go too far. You'll come back in a few items. Uh, but now we're going to go to the Department of General Services. And as Director Dice and his team work their way up, I'll turn it over to the Chair of the GEO Committee, Councilmember Stewart. Great. Thank you all. Um, we had a great conversation on uh, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee uh, with Director Dice and his team. And first, I just want to say thank you uh, to all the work you do. I think DGS is one of those departments that um, if people don't know where you are, that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, once they start knowing who you are, that's, uh, that probably means there's an issue. So um, the first item uh, that we uh, wanted to take up was a continuation of the conversation that the Public Safety Committee had regarding uh, the enhanced facilities maintenance support of volunteer owned fire stations. Uh, the GEO committee uh, agreed with the shift of the $2 million, uh, but as we discussed this with Director Dice and um, his team, the five uh, FTEs that were being created in order to take on this work, uh, it became clear that the over $500,000 budgeted for that may not be needed in this year uh, because the $2 million um, is mostly contract work and you'll be shifting that and we'll be able to use money out of that $2 million uh, to cover any FTEs. Um, and so we thought we could uh, cut the uh, amount of money for the FTEs, obviously keep them there as the uh, department is shifting over to con from contractors to full-time employees. Did I get that correct? Yeah. All right. Um, so that's pretty much a reduction and then cost neutral in the shifting of the $2 million. Very good. Any comments from colleagues? Not seeing any. All those in favor of the DGS budget as approved by the Government Operations Committee, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Oh. See, we're on a roll here. Thank you, Director Dyson team. <laughs> You, you would know where the exits are. You built them, right? Make sure, make sure it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Follow this song. Check out my thermostat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I know. <laughs> See, you didn't get out fast enough, did you? <laughs> okay, colleagues. Now we're moving on to the FY23 to 28 CIP for the White Oak Science Gateway Redevelopment. Turn it over to the Economic Development Committee Chair, Fana Gonzalez. This is actually very exciting. Uh, I had to provide a brief history. In 2014, the Montgomery County Council approved the White Oak Science Gateway Master Plan. The plan establishes a vision for transforming what has been an industrial area into a denser, mixed-use commercial and residential center in which people can walk to work, shop, spark schools, and take transit. The county's initiative includes using both previously county-owned property and privately-owned property as a public-private partnership and leveraging existing relationships with a nearby Food and Drug Administration campus to advance development activities in this area. The efforts happening in this area are key to achieve the desired tree development in the White Oak sector area and elsewhere in the eastern portion of Montgomery County, creating job opportunities, expanding the tax base, which is very, very important. 
The amendment that we have today addresses the planning and development coordination activities by the county that are necessary to implement the redevelopment of 110 acre parcel on Industrial Parkway. The recommended PDF transmitted by the county executive on March 15, 2023, retains a total of 40 million for road construction as in the previously approved CIP, but the, the county executive is now recommending deferring funds, including 18.5 million to the beyond six years for fiscal capacity. A previous amendment transmitted in January 2023 deferred 11.5 million to the beyond six years. The uh, Economic Development Committee, um, in, all of us voted in favor of this. I have personally met with the property owner on this project and along with the county con with the council staff have received recent reports that a development team has been formed recently, finally. A full briefing to the Econ Committee by the development team is anticipated in summer 2023, and I'll make sure that the district council member for the area is aware, because you need to be there. Uh, anything else that I missed? No, just to note that um, this is a project we're looking at for CIP reconciliation, so next week we'll have a, a, a final proposed version of this. Okay. Very good. Uh, Councilmember Mink, you got. I appreciate your work on this. I'll continue to be engaged. Thank you so much. There you go. Very good. So we have a recommendation from the Economic Development Committee for the White Oak Science Gateway Redevelopment. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. And the last budgetary item this morning, uh, I'll turn it back over to the Public Safety Committee Chair to talk about the Office of Inver Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This too was a 3-0 vote. What we did decide, and, and I, is the executive's recommended increase of $200,000 for nonprofit security grants. We, we uh, said to put on the reconciliation list of two tranches, $100,000 each, the first tranche being high priority, the second being priority. Uh, you know, we would all love to put them, I, I think it was, Certainly uh, noted that we um, were appreciative of the, of the 200,000, but uh, during this tight budget, uh, we felt that one in one was, was the appropriate spot and approve all other components uh, as recommended by the executive. There again, it was a 3 0 vote. Very good. Thank you. I see uh, Councilman, uh, Council Vice President Friesen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Chair Katz, and to the committee. Really appreciate your thoughtful work on this. Thank you to Director Hodgson. I see Dr. Stoddard uh, here as well. Um, I, I just, I I'm, would like to propose moving both $100,000 tranches to high priority for the security grants program. Uh, I appreciate splitting it up. I think that's important to allow for uh, some, if not all, to be a possibility, uh, but uh, recognize that it's gonna be difficult to get everything on high priority funded in the budget. Uh, priority would mean that it is almost impossible uh, to, uh, to fund it, unfortunately, in this budget. Uh, I'll just note the amount of requests for organizations was more than double. The funding, even if the full million is covered, there's $2.1 million in requests. In light of the increases in incidents impacting organizations that would be at higher risk of hate crimes, that number is likely to go up a significant amount, uh, and so uh, the the prior amount was 2.1 million in requests. This would fund less than half of that. Uh, if we're not able to fund the additional uh, increase, we would be substantially uh, lower than that. I'll just note, uh, and I'm very proud uh, of the prior council, uh, even in a same services budget, this $700,000 initial funding request that I worked with the county executive uh, on that Chair Katz knows and, and Council Member Alvernaz that were part of a town hall meeting with faith organizations uh, in light of these issues, which was the impetus to that program. Uh, the council funded the 700,000 even amid uh, same services. If anything, uh, there is uh, more need today than there was in light of that. We also expanded it. I'll just remind colleagues who weren't there for for that, it was originally focused on religious-based nonprofit organizations uh, and bias incidents. Uh, in light of the anti-Asian hatred that we were experiencing, uh, we expanded it uh, to ethnic and religious-based organizations. And I'll note, if you go through the recipients, 
Uh, it covers a broad breadth of religious and ethnic organizations, uh, all who face significant challenges, unfortunately, in deeply divisive, very violent, uh, and very scary times. And it has been a lifeline to many of these uh, organization across faith uh, and across uh, ethnic uh, organizations. So I, uh, in light of that, I appreciate the recommendation. I do think it should stay separated with $100,000 tranches, uh, but would request that we move both $100,000 tranches uh, into high priority. I'll second. second. It. second. Oh. Yeah. Everybody second. jumping in to second it. Good luck. There we go. Uh, yeah. I heard Councilmember Katz, so, uh, well, so that is that seconded. Uh, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Stewart. Well, I was going to second it. Thank you, <laughs> Councilmember Friedson. Um, and, and just say I uh, agree with uh, what was said. And I just wanted to extend my great thanks um, to all of you and the work that you do. Um, and, you know, like our police department and our fire department, you all, like, you see, you do see people on their worst days. Um, and I so appreciate the work um, that you do. Um, and I think doing these grants um, is so important um, because of the, the world we live in right now. Um, and we, we need to make sure that we're doing all we can uh, so that people feel safe and we going to either their places of, places of worship, so nonprofits or any place. And, um, and I'm hoping that by putting these in place, uh, we do reduce the need for you all to respond to incidents. So I fully support moving this to high priority. Thank you. Councilmember Katz, did you have any additional comment? No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Whatever it is, we're Council Member Stewart. There, there you go. Uh, Council Member Fonny Gonzalez. Um, I was also going to, I agree with Council Member uh, Fritzen. Many of these hateful incidents have been happening in my district and it's really heartbreaking. So anything that we can do um, to fight against that and bring love to our community is important, so I do wholly agree that, um, wholeheartedly agree that it should be a high priority, the whole thing. Thank you. And had not there been uh, a rush to second or third or fourth, as the case may be, I would have thrown my hat in as well. Uh, I know that uh, after the, the uh, applications closed, um, more people requested uh, support. Um, and there was a, a church that was in the greater Olney area that reached out to me after an anti-LGBTQ incident, and they did not even know about the support, um, which is how I learned that uh, just this year it was already overburdened. So I, I support this effort as well. Councilmember Mink. Thanks. As, as part of the original 3-0 vote, I just wanted to weigh in as well. I'll support this um, amendment and um, agree with all of the all the points that you raise. And um, as we've been talking about, that it makes sense, I think, to aim for the bottom of where we realistically think the need is going to be, not to under not to underfund knowingly, and uh, then have to consider an appropriation or simply running out of funds for something important later on. So I support thanks. So all those in favor of moving the security grants from priority to high priority, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. In two tranches. Uh, in two tranches. Yep, 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 in two tranches. Um, any other comments, colleagues, regarding the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security? Um, I will just also say that I know that uh, your office has been doing a lot this year, um, particularly with uh, apartment blazes um, and making sure that individuals are taken care of and their families and so there's no shortage of work that you are undertaking and so we we do appreciate that thank you and with that there's a public safety recommendation all those in favor of the recommendation raise your hand and that is unanimous thank you okay Colleagues, we're now going to move to the consent calendar. Uh, and for the first item, I need to ask for a motion to suspend the rules, to suspend Rule 7C, so that we may, we may act upon the resolution on the same day it is introduced. Uh, and that is specifically a resolution regarding the action to acknowledge that yesterday there was an election uh, in the village of Friendship Heights, and so that that needs to be acknowledged uh, in this consent calendar, can I call for a motion to adopt that resolution? Second. Uh, moved by Vice President Friesen, seconded by Councilmember Albernaz. All uh, and can I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Motion. Uh, <laughs> moved, moved by Councilmember Ludke, seconded by Vice President Friesen. Uh, and Council, uh, uh, let's approve it, and then you can make a comment. Sure. Great. Uh, all those in favor of the consent calendar, raise your hand. 
That is unanimous. Vice President Friedson. Yeah, just very quickly, I have the great honor and distinct privilege of serving as the Chief Judge of the Friendship Heights Village election, which I have done and is the tradition for the District 1 Council Member to do. I started yesterday before uh, budget at 7 a.m. to uh, open and inspect the ballot box and uh, unlocked, locked it, and then uh, returned at 8 o'clock, left uh, when final tabulations were done uh, just before 10 p.m. Just want to congratulate uh, all of those who put their hat into the arena. Not easy thing to do, particularly in a hyper-local uh, election uh, where there are such engaged residents like we have uh, and are so fortunate uh, to have in Friendship Heights. And also, especially, I uh, wanted to thank the League of Women Voters. Uh, this is uh, an election that is run exclusively by volunteers at the League. Uh, I have seen them in action, how dedicated they are. Uh, many of them put in 13, 14 hour days uh, yesterday, and they're just an extraordinary resource to uh, defending our democracy at the local level and, and truly uh, living our values out loud. And so I just want to congratulate the winning candidates, the candidates who, uh, who, who were willing to put their hat in the arena, and all the volunteers uh, and staff members the, at the Friendship Heights Village who uh, helped to make uh, that election uh, a success. So thank you very much. Very good. Not seeing any other comments. We are adjourned until uh, 1 o'clock when we will have uh, another proclamation. Thank you all. A.M. on the U.S. 29 corridor.